Sorry, good morning, everyone. I'm going to start. So welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I am Daniela Torres, Latin America Lead of the Greening the Financial Regulation Initiative of WWF. On behalf of the Central Bank of Chile, the Worldwide Fund of Nature, and the Finance Initiative of the United Nations Environment Program, it's my pleasure to welcome you at this conference on biodiversity loss and ecosystem de degradation, implications for macroeconomics and financial stability. First of all, a few housekeeping rules. The conference is broadcasted live um, on the Central Bank of Chile YouTube channel, the Facebook Live, as well as on ICARE TV channel for these two hours. Um, the recording of all panels of each day will be available on the Central Bank of Chile's YouTube channel just after the conference. Please note that we have simultaneous translations from English into Spanish, and we will also have the recordings available in both languages. Please share uh, your questions and, um, in the Q&A section, and at the end of each panel, we will, we will have 10 minutes to address as much as we can. So now let me pass the floor to my colleague, Gonzalo Garcia Trujillo, Senior Economist at the Monetary Policy Division of the Central Bank of Chile, who will be guiding this conference as well and giving you a big picture of this today's conference and what you should expect. Gonzalo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniela. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. I'm pleased to welcome all of you to this exciting and important conference. We are delighted to bring together regular authorities, members of central banks and the broader financial system, non-governmental organizations, as well as academics in economics, finance, and other disciplines. In the next two days, our distinguished speakers will share their, their experiences and reflections on several fundamental issues. First, they will explain us the importance of biodiversity and the health of our ecosystems for macroeconomic macroeconomic and financial stability. Second, they will analyze and exemplify the main challenges and opportunities in terms of long-term economic growth and financial risks related to biodiversity through the presentation of real case studies. And third, they will discuss methodologies and tools to measure and incorporate biodiversity and natural capital into standard macrofinancial analysis, as well as into the broader economic policy toolkit in line with the different mandates and interests of various government institutions and actors of our society. Their expertise and insights will surely provide invaluable guidance on how to navigate the very challenging climate and environmental transitions that we urgently need to address. We hope you enjoyed this conference and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gonzalo. I'm gonna switch to Spanish now. Please know that just uh, this inaugural session will be in Spanish. Um, vamos a arrancar nuestra sesión inaugural. Es un placer. We'll begin con... our initial session. It's a pleasure to count with the presence of Mrs. Rosana Costa, the president of the Bank, Central Bank of Chile, who will share some welcome words with us. Mrs. President, thank you very much. You have the floor. Good morning, Daniela. Thank you very much. Thank you to all who are interested in these conferences, in, these, in this opening, and the speakers and the participants of this um, webinar organized by the Central Bank of Chile and the World Wildlife Fund and the Fund Initi Initiative of the United Nations. It's, I'd like to uh, welcome all of you in this opening moment. I'd also take the chance to thank those who have worked to make this event possible. In the previous years, we have faced deep changes, structural changes, such as those that have uh, brought about the pandemics. And we are at the, central, at the Central Bank. We have been working to better understand the consequences of these changes but of course these events and their consequences reach beyond the economic um, space we have to face them as a society to everybody together and the central bank in this moment has in this period has 
worked untiringly with the same commitment to uh, to stabilize the situation and uh, reach the goals and to also to preserve the financial stability. We are an institution that works with a prospective forward-looking based basing our dis decisions in economic projections and having cleared that to reach uh, middle uh, middle term goals but we one of the doublessly one of the challenges we face is the environment in this field it's also important to make decisions looking forward even though it's more challenging now because it needs um, long-term models and projections in our country the most evident projection of the climate change is the drought. Uh, it's a cyclic phenomenon and uh, beyond a, ten, a trend that has threatened our nature, our economics, and our well-being. However, the governments are the ones that have the challenging task of leading, coordinating, and bringing about the decisions to face those uh, environmental challenges. This is a difficult process of energetic trans transition and uh, environmental at the global level. We have to join hands with the scientific world and promote innovation and technological innovation in a sustainable way. The consumers on their turn will continuously contribute to align this goal by means of their preferences, but all this requires knowledge. The Central Bank of Chile is one of the 78 institutions of its kind in the world that has incorporated in its work uh, associate themes associated with the climate change, always under the terms of its mandate, in the competence and all these central banks. It, it's, it differs according to the institutionality of each, for instance, some have the role of financial supervision, which in our country are carried out by the financial, uh, another institution. But we can see the differences in, in all cases, there are impacts for which uh, the, uh, it's necessary to be prepared. And the plan of the central bank, the st strategic plan of the, the central bank incorporated um, linking the economic activities with the environmental dimension for internal and external analysis. In this sense, in the past year, uh, with a focus on products, we have published a study with methodology to measure the footprint, the carbon footprint, and the analysis of uh, emissions reductions and the contributions that these distinct sectors could make. It's important, we believe, and it's also must be uh, looked at with the costs and uh, earnings of each field. And we're also analyzing financial risk. It's a central theme for us. On the other hand, we found the presence of catastrophic events linked to, linked to climate change um, more frequently and more intensely. On the other hand, this requires determining how the climate change and the degradation of nature can represent uh, future financial risks, which is the measure that we are trying to internalize and uh, so we could uh, deal with them and they could affect the health of the financial system. For instance, this um, in the central bank's financial report, we have a chapter on climate risks and the uh, with the response to climate change. And the results of this study is that approximately 30% of the properties in Chile are exposed to it until 2050. In the macro zones and the northern and central macro zones are the ones most exposed to the physical risks on coast, at the coastal level to inundations and the drought. But the northern macro zones, the metropolitan region and central region of the countries are the most exposed to a decrease of water resources and temperature increases. And where we have 86% of the companies and 88% of the population. So the challenge is to go from this partial look and the 
calculate the impacts in the field, in the sectors that could produce systemic risks for our future work agenda, the central bank, and to expand knowledge on this field, we have integrated to the network to deal with the financial system. In the EFS, in its English abbreviation, it's a set of experience and highly valued knowledge with a similar purpose. We maintain an active participation in forums of international institutions, such as the Council for Financial Stability. In terms of international reserves, we started evaluating the factibility of investing a small percentage of our portfolio in green bonds. And in as much as they uh, comply with uh, applicable uh, requirements for our in investments. On the other hand, from 2019, we're part of the uh, green funding ground ta round table. And in the past year, we advised the Committee of Natural Capital with the Ministry of the Environment, Ministry of Finances, Ministry of the Economics, and the National Council of Science, Technology, Knowledge, and Innovation. This committee is the collaborative in instance among institutions, a powerful one with the goal of developing methodologies to measure the real value of multiple services uh, provided on a daily basis by our ecosystems. The conference, this conference is a good reflection of the challenges ahead, the impacts of climate change, and which are the multiple global solutions to be considered in order to preserve or for the preservation of the stable conditions of our planet. Changes in the use of the land, disponibility, availability of water, loss of wildlife, all these dimensions will be analyzed in this event. It, and recently, the, it start, these scientific themes started to be uh, considered at the global level in the financial and economic analysis. And today and tomorrow, we'll have the participation of national experts, international experts, and they will all contribute to the discussion on how the environmental challenge that we face Affect, will affect our econo economy and the financial risks and the implications for measuring national capital and its use as a tool for decision-making in public policies. I expect and hope that this policy becomes a collaborative instance between the central bank and the academic institutions so we may learn more about the uh, consequences of the loss of biodiversity and our ecosystems. I am sure that on the one hand, it will expand our knowledge, and on the other, it will make, our, it will make us more aware of the significance of these challenges for our society and how we can tackle them in order to build a future we can proud about and pass on to the future generations. Thank you very much, and may this be a very productive event for all of us. Thank you, um, Governor Costa. It's a pleasure to now receive Mrs. Uh, the Minister of the Environment of Chile, Maiza Rojas. Minister Rojas, you have the floor. Good morning. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to thank to the Central Bank of Chile for uh, putting together this conference and its co-hosts World Wildlife Fund and UNEP initiative. I'd like especially, particularly to salute the presidency of the Central Bank, the President uh, Rosanna, the President of Icaro, Icari, Mr. Darmusi, uh, together with these welcoming words, as well as all of participants who are connected for this transmission. In the context of this context, where we are emphasizing the relevance of collaboration in the development of debates with a look towards the great challenge that we have to face as a humanity, I'd like to, first of all, to uh, refer to the proof of the role of nature in the needs 
of our societies. The contributions of nature to, to every people, for instance, the regulation of the quality of the air, of what the water, carbon uh, sequestration, or the pollinization of our crops, they contribute to the human well-being and consequently they are a fundamental aspect of the 2030 agenda of sustainable development of the UN. However, and despite the deep changes of the deep disrespects of the in, 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 international studies and organizations have shown us that many human activities are producing a loss of biodiversity and the degradation of natural systems. Let us remind that this in this year we have 50 years now from the first conference of the United Nations in Stockholm to approach the theme of nature. And the truth is that the situation instead of improving is, on, is only getting worse and the multidisciplinary and complete scientific approach at the global level where they have ev evaluated the interactions between people and nature by IP IPBS. And in their 2019 report, they showed that the loss of biodiversity and climate change and the loss of, and the, and the human well-being must be approached in an integrated way these challenges, these social economical challenges, result from the interactions between societies and nature in which these relations are measured according to the local context in order to reduce social and environmental impacts. And therefore, deep changes are necessary and quick ones towards sustainability. And in this context, the current government of Chile which is declared to be as the self-declared as the first ecologist government and that the Ministry of the Environment, we have been translated this commitment by our president into a vision of what the country must carry out. And it is a transition, a process towards a social ecological transition. Now, um, Considering the insufficiency of a transit of a quick change bit towards the necessary uh, sustainability, it's necessary to quantify the natural heritage. I will give you an example, despite the fact I'm not an economist. Let's consider a family with their source of income from the sellings, however, of a, of a store, but and the mechanism that this family decides to implement is to generate, to have an extra business, which is to sell tiles and the uh, furnitures of their home. Their gross product will certainly increase, but in a couple of years, they will be homeless. They will be without their warehouse. And finally, they won't be able to move forward. In short, not destructing the walls of the house is fundamental for the existence and subsistence of this family. And we refer, when we speak about this, we are referring to this uh, uh, in relation between man and nature. And uh, this is how we must with it. Thus, the way in which we account for our wealth does not include the goods and services on which the economic activities are sustained. We can compromise the goods that we have for activities that we cannot maintain in the long term. Now, it's fundamental to have data to identify the routes that allow us to make the economic changes. Nowadays, approximately $44 million dollars more billion dollars over half the world gdp depend on biodiversity and large largely depend on it so regarding the management of the impact can produce a loss of financial value and continuous degradation of those services would mean an annual loss of at least 
479 million dollars a year and let's remember that this information we have for chile is more than half of the ecosystems are degraded and 60 percent of our species are threatened so the laws of biodiversity contamination uh, drafts as mentioned by the president and other environmental problems affect all people and it also impacts materially the receipts that companies may have and also can bring financial instability so those problems affect banks and insurances as uh, mentioned recently by uh, the, the the bank about financial stability so the resilience uh, theory reminds us that ecological systems are all interrelated and they support ecology then its value cannot be measured in a very marginal way uh, everything i mentioned shows the importance to institutionalize strengthen and develop and apply accountability of natural capital in chile which is a very vulnerable country uh, to climate change so the accountability of the country the working of our system and its contributions to people allows us to have a holistic view regarding biophysical data and natural capital so that we can link it with economy and measure if we are using it sustainably or if we are let's say uh, approaching it in a negative way and we are going to the instability so everything would contribute to a more holistic view of design processes for environmental policies, promoting also technology, and uh, it would lead us to a strong sustainability and social ecological systems that are more resilient, that respect the limits of the world. I would like to remind you also that during this week, we are promulgating the climate change law with the objective of committing Chile with the Paris Agreement. Uh, and by 2050, we will be in agreement with all that. And in the context of everything I mentioned, we are very happy for the recently created uh, Natural Capital Committee and this permanent organ has the goal of supporting the president of republic regarding uh, valuation of natural capital in chile and promoting the integration of nature biodiversity with the sustainable development of the country and uh, the recognition of the contributions of biodiversity as a basis of the social well-being so the central bank will be a permanent assessor or counselor and the committee will try to serve as a coordination instance allowing to open an integrated process for the recognition measurement and evaluation of a Chilean natural capital and also design and uh, the use of political uh, policy, public policies for the protection of nature and biodiversity in benefits of a social uh, so society today and in the future. We also count with the participation of the economy ministry, science technology ministry, and also the National Council of Science and Technology for development. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your words, Minister Rojas. Uh, finally, I welcome Mr. Lorenzo Gasmori, President of CARI, which who will give us the welcoming words. 
Good morning. So I start my words greeting the president of Central Bank in Chile and also Minister of uh, Environment. I have the privilege of sharing this panel here. So uh, thank you very much for the Central Bank to promoting this program and uh, so that we can know how biodiversity affects our economy. Over 70% of the surface has been affected by human activities. So we are in a very difficult position. We need to take a look at the natural world and we need to take care of it. When we uh, weight the richness we have, we see the way how we need to deal with it. So as Minister said, to measure wealth, we need to see growth, but uh, we also need to take care of how much have we affected the environment in that process. So we need to understand how natural and economical systems work together. As many of major world systems, the solutions need several actors and we need companies to work with us. We need to treat climate, biodiversity, and human society as three complex systems that are dependent on each other. This is the model we need to use uh, to make the future. So sustainable development, and it, it's also contemplated, but the most focus for companies today is in um, decreasing the emission of gases. So there's a, an opportunity for us. We need to reestablish those systems. It would be interesting if we could make those three questions. The first one, what are the economic benefits of biodiversity in the global level? Second question, what are the risks and challenges for economy? So the most rele relevant question I would make and we would, which we would focus I'll, above our companies, how to identify actions that could improve simultaneously biodiversity and generate prosperity. Which question should we answer first? Which one is most relevant? And here we have a point where many looks come together. We look for collaboration to build a better country. When you articulate economy and ecology together, we can save the world we can save human society. It's a challenge that we need to accept. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gazmuri, for your words. And now we're coming back to English to continue with our conference. We thank our three speakers for their, their opening speeches. And now let's start with our first, first panel, Introduction to Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. 
Please recall that if you join us by Zoom, you can select the English or Spanish channel, clicking the interpretation icon and selecting and selecting the language that you would like to hear. Please share your questions in the Q&A section located on the left side of the menu bar below your screens. So let me pass now, let me now to pass the floor to Ms. Stephanie Griffin Jones, board member of the Central Bank of Chile, who will be the moderator for our first panel. Stephanie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Gonzalo. Um, I'm very honored to be chairing the session. I apologize that the camera on my computer is not working, um, but I want to make a brief introduction and then introduce our three very distinguished speakers. Um, I would like to stress that there is fortunately far greater awareness of the speed of a massive scale of climate change and it's extremely harmful and broad effects on society, as well as a macroeconomic and financial stability effects, as well as more broadly. Even though till now, there is still insufficient action given the scale of a problem by different actors. However, there is unfortunately a far smaller awareness of the scale of biodiversity loss and ecosystem degradation, which is also advancing, as has been said by the previous distinguished speakers, at an alarming rate. And this is far less known than climate change, even though these phenomena are happening at the same time and are complementarily damaging economic prospects. Indeed, most households, businesses, authorities, and financial institutions still do not acknowledge this important event of loss of biodiversity. As a result, nature is not being taken into account in economic decisions, nor in standard macroeconomic and financial analysis, and even less in policy making in these and in other fields. In the first session of this conference, we will have these three leading experts who will help us understand how human well-being crucially depends on nature and how our activities also have impacts on it and how our future is going to be bounded by this interaction. And most importantly, what kind of actions we should undertake to ensure a sustainable human and economic development. I should mention that the central bank is of course, as, as the president explained, uh, already very active but the new, I would also like to mention that the new Chilean constitution, if approved in September, uh, would ratify furthermore how uh, the central bank in the pursuit of its main goals, which is inflation control, should take account of nature in its uh, important policy decisions. So there will be even a deeper commitment uh, to fighting climate change and biodiversity loss. Um, without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Ms. Elizabeth Maruma uh, to speak kindly for 23 minutes. Ms. Maruma, in many ways, needs no introduction because she's so, had such a distinguished career both internationally and in her country. She's currently Executive Secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, and she's worked with UNEP for over two decades. Um, and she has also, before joining UNEP, worked with the Tanzania's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, as well as having a distinguished academic career. Thank you very much. Thank you very, thank you very much, Stefan. I hope you can hear me. Can you confirm? Thank you. Let me begin first by thanking the governor of the Central Bank of Chile, the Minister of Environment of Chile, the president of ICARE, for all for organizing this important event and for inviting me 
to share my viene Matis para compartir sí lo presenta ella sorry can I continue <laughs> I said, I'm pleased to share my few perspectives with you and discuss the implications of biodiversity loss on microeconomic and financial stability. Myself, as you have indicated, as the executive secretary uh, of the Convention on Biological Diversity, currently leading the development of the global biodiversity framework, the role of the financial institutions and financial regulators in mitigating biodiversity loss as well as the policy and governance framework around biodiversity is of great personal concern. Let me begin with the role of the financial sector. The financial sector is a very important player in terms of the outcomes of biodiversity. Hence why I've taken equally the role of the co-chair of the Task Force on Nature Related Financial Disclosure or TNFD. For now, Nearly one year, I've had a great pleasure to interact with motivated financial institutions who strongly understand the implications of loss of biodiversity on their own portfolios and are motivated to raise awareness among their peers on how financial industry can be used as a key lever to bring forward an economic transformation that respect ecosystems as well as planetary boundaries. The role of the financial sector on nature should always be viewed in two parts. First, steering the economy away from harming practices and towards the restorative and regenerative ones. This is at the heart of the concept of alignment of financial flows, inspired by some degree by the successes of Article 2.1c of the Paris Agreement. Coming out of the Geneva negotiations held in March this year, I am pleased to see a wide understanding of the need to include the language at a global level, the highest order of the global biodiversity framework, calling for alignment of public and private financial flows with nature. Alignment of finance means, first of all, this incentivizing harmful practices and requiring basic safeguards for biodiversity. The draft framework, which contains language calling for repurposing, reforming, or redirecting about 500 billion US dollars per year used for harmful subsidies into biodiversity positive activities. A draft target number 15 calls for businesses, including financial, institutions to disclose their impacts and dependencies on nature and manage the related risks. Yet, in terms of division, in finalizing the framework, parties still remain far apart on the means of implementation of the framework, meaning particularly availability of financial resources for its implementation. There was a hard line from the parties around digital sequencing information for gen from genetic resources or DSI. This include, for example, DNA or amino acid sequences, which has, uh, has an application, for instance, in synthetic biology, such as in food production and pharmaceuticals. Some parties proposed new funding, such as 1% levy on products using digital sequencing information to be put into a new global biodiversity fund. We hope that by the time delegates meet again next month in June in Nairobi and the intersessional consultations which have been going on will have narrowed the divergences even further to enable an agreement to be found on this important topic. On the other hand, in terms of bringing new finances for nature, I've been thrilled to see the appetite of the financial sector to understand the opportunities that this presents. There is a growing recognition from the financial sector that investing in nature-based solutions, 
will help them to meet their existing net zero commitments, which cover at least $130 trillion in assets. The science has clearly told us that 37% of the strategies to reach the Paris Agreement 1.5 degrees target will actually come from nature. So at least one third of the transition finance should go towards ecosystem production and ecosystem restoration. My back of envelope calculations suggest that if understanding and awareness of the role of ecosystem in the natural climate solutions gain pace, we will quite, quite quickly close the $4 trillion uh, nature finance gap identified in the recent UNEP WEF, among others. All the governments of the world have recognized this potential recently at the UN Environment Assembly, whereby with the first, for the first time a resolution had been agreed at a UN-wide level on nature-based solutions for climate emergence. This resolution also recognized the need for a just transition for people and the planet. Biodiversity funds, biodiversity funds our economy and our future serving as the ultimate foundation of life. Investing in a healthy, resilient environment is not optimal for any finance entity, public or private. The current global domestic budget for biodiversity conservation is about 76 billion US dollars, while the amount needed for effective biodiversity conservation is over 10 times what is available. Countries do spend domestic public budgets on nature conservation, but it remains chronically underfunded and relies heavily on overseas development aid, thereby missing the long-term ambition. So there is need for a more innovative financial approaches that brings together country planning and appropriately designed private sector financing that can eliminate deforestation, halt biodiversity loss, restore habitats, and strengthen the well being of the local communities and the land rights of the indigenous peoples and local communities. Let me say a few words with regards to regulatory and supervisory role. While voluntary initiatives are critically important, I will not leave something so important as our life support systems to a market alone. Regulatory and supervisory entities play an incredibly important role in mitigating biodiversity loss. The Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosure, which builds from the Task Force on Climate Financial Disclosure and learned lessons from it to not limit to immediate financial materiality today, but emphasize that impacts and dependencies can become financial risks over time. The TNFD has developed a LEAP approach, LEAP actually standing for location, evaluation, assess, and preparation. That's the LEAP approach, which is complementarily voluntary guidance to assist the market participants with their internal analysis to apply the TNFD disclosure recommendation. So as I said, LIP stands for where the ability of the company to locate their interface with nature, to be able to evaluate their dependencies and impacts on nature and assess their risks and opportunities they have on the activities on nature and finally be able to prepare to respond to nature related risks and opportunities and report to other investors. A targeted version of this LEAP approach has also been created for specific sectorial needs, again, for financial institutions. What does this all mean in practice? Location, location, location. 
Within the task force on nature related financial disclosure, nature is seen as a construct of the biogeographical realm of land, ocean, freshwater, and atmosphere. These provide an entry point for understanding how organizations and people depend on and impact natural capital. So the LEAP process starts with location, locate. However, we realize data on location specific impacts and dependencies are often limited. Research, for instance, from the Credit Suisse and responsible investor found that 70% of investors interviewed believed that lack of available data was a key barrier for making or to making investments supporting biodiversity. I would like to highlight also the report Nature in a Haystack, which was launched in April and developed by a range of UN bodies. And based on the review from publicly available nature-related data in five, five case study countries, namely Costa Rica, India, Indonesia, Mexico, and South Africa. Actually, the study found out that a lack of decision-grade data, in a, on a lack of decision-grade data, only 7% of nature-related data sets identified in the five case studies countries were deemed suitable for financial decision making based on expert judgment and alignment with the characteristics of decision grade data. In addition, commercial use was either unclear or restricted for 55% of the nature related data sets, which were identified in these uh, five countries case studies which indicated that while suitable national data may exist, business entities may not be permitted to use many of these data sets due to use restriction. This is why working with the founding partners of the task force on financial disclosure, such as the UN Development Program, UNDP, and UN Environment Program, UNEP Financial Initiative, on a country level data and developing capacity, especially in emerging markets. And early next year, a new initiative is expected to be launched that will make a significant dent in this long-standing uh, data challenge. Indeed, working in emerging markets is critical for nature. With the special issue of location for nature versus climate disclosure, the location of biodiversity in the global south is highly significant. Comparatively, we need to engage much more in emerging markets to deal with nature loss as compared to greenhouse gas emissions reductions, for example. This is one of the reasons leading the TNFD to launch a fund to widen access to piloting the TNFD data framework launched early in March this year will ensure its relevance where biodiversity actually exists. This also means that we need to recognize much more prominently the role of indigenous peoples and local communities or IPLCs in protecting nature and biodiversity globally. A recent research by WWF and others showed that 91% of indigenous peoples and local communities' lands are in good or fair ecological condition, and that the IPLC's land cover at least 36% of the global land area uh, by key biodiversity areas or KBA, the sites most in need of protection globally. Previous research had shown that biodiversity is better managed through such systems than even state protected areas. So indigenous peoples and local communities lands cover a third of land and fresh water, but over a quarter of these areas could face high 
development pressure in the future. This underlines the need for IPLC's rights, governance, and access and use of resources to be secured as part of the proposed efforts to increase land and sea areas under protection. Within all forms of policy for biodiversity, we must ensure IPLC's rights to land, inland waters, resources are recognized and formalized and that they receive appropriate recognition and support, including funding for their contributions to conservation. Few words on policy and governance framework. We are in a multi-year process to develop the global biodiversity framework with nearly all governments around the world engaged. At a recent meeting held in Geneva, parties made good progress to advance the draft framework. And now this text is owned by them, the governments. The negotiated outcome text reflect views of delegates and initial compromises for all the four 2050 goals and the 2030 mission and for most of the 2030 targets. The journey to complete the global biodiversity framework continues with urgency via, via an additional negotiated negotiating session to be hosted in Nairobi in June later next month. This will ensure that parties are prepared once they get to Kunming later this year to finalize the ambitious yet achievable goals and targets. We expect the outcomes to demonstrate greater synergies with climate change agenda, including the importance to integrate and harmonize the outstanding and the understanding and assessments of biodiversity risks to climate risks and the key role nature-based climate solutions shall have in low carbon transition. This important priority was again just reinforced by the recent Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change Working Group 3 report on climate change mitigation, which highlighted that nature-based solutions when sustainably implemented can deliver large-scale greenhouse gas emission reduction and enhance removal and provide core benefits such as in biodiversity conservation, ecosystem services and livelihood and avoid risks through adaptation to climate change. So I'm really pleased to see the leadership of the Republic of Chile on this topic. Chile has, been a strong, has made strong commitments on climate action and sustainable finance reflecting the insurance of sovereign green bonds since 2019, social bonds since 2020, and sustainable bonds since last year, among many other initiatives. So building on the efforts led by the Minister of Finance in the climate action space, at the request of the Green Finance Public-Private Roundtable, Chile recently released, as I understand, uh, a report titled Taxonomy Roadmap for Chile, which provides their assessment on the approach towards developing a national taxonomy in Chile. This initiative is aligned with the government of Chile's commitment to orient financial flows towards a carbon neutral economy, a just transition and sustainable development. I was glad to be informed that following the invitation extended by the Ministry of Environment on July 29, the board of the Central Bank of Chile also decided to join the National Capital Committee, a group that created by the said ministry and supported by the National Council of Science, Technology, Knowledge and Innovation. So the committee uh, will actually provide those recommendations regarding measurements for the stock of natural capital in the country. This is an excellent leading initiative to better direct financial markets towards positive biodiversity outcome. And the Central Bank of Chile, through its statistic division, will then focus on identifying 
uh, concrete methodologies, viable plans for implementing the measurements of the natural capital, building on its expertise in the development of national economic accounts and following the recently published UN guidelines for the system of economic and environmental accounting ecosystem accounting. In conclusion, I'm certain with inspiring leadership such as shown by Chile, we will build solutions that enable biodiversity compatible development trajectories. Financial institutions and financial regulators will continue to play a key role in mitigating the loss of biodiversity. And I welcome these efforts as beacon for other Southern parties to the convention. I look forward to today's proceedings and our joint work to turn the tide of biodiversity loss in the year ahead. Thank you very much. Stephanie, your, your mic is up. Stephanie, I think you are having issues with your microphone. Okay, so. Okay, so let me thank you, uh, Mrs. Merema's uh, words. And let's uh, continue now uh, with our next panelist, uh, Mr. Uh, Geoffrey Hill. Uh, so Mr. Hill, the, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Everything working right with this connection? Great. Yeah, we hear you okay. Good, thank you very much indeed. Well, let me start off by uh, thanking the Central Bank of Chile for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to take part in this discussion. And also let me uh, follow the previous speaker in congratulating Chile on taking an initiative in this area. It's an area where there's an awful lot of uh, discussion and good intentions, but relatively little concrete action. So it'd be wonderful to see uh, the government of Chile actually break out of that pattern and uh, take concrete actions in this area. Let me start off by sharing my screen with you. Let's see if this works. Great. Can you all see a, a blue slide there? No feedback, so I assume you can. Okay. Um, yes, we can. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to give you a quick overview of the basic economics of biodiversity losses and the consequences of biodiversity losses and essentially what, what biodiversity does for the economy. I'll be elaborating somewhat on what Elizabeth said and what the Minister of the Environment said earlier on. Um, <clears throat> just to show you how timely this is, this is actually the headlines of an email I received from the big consulting company McKinsey Co. Uh, just a couple of days ago, earlier this week. Um, the lead item in their sort of weekly email was, can protecting biodiversity save the world? And they go on to say basically that it's, uh, it, it, can, it can, to give a, to, to cut a long story short, uh, that saving, conserving biodiversity, protecting biodiversity can make a major contribution to the preservation of our economies. Um, so let me, let me go into this in a bit more detail. How should we think as economists of biodiversity? Um, so the key thing to realize about biodiversity is that it's an asset. I just think of biodiversity as a very valuable asset. It's what we call natural capital, a form of capital, a form of capital stock. Um, we're all familiar, obviously, with the conventional capital, which is physical capital, uh, buildings, uh, computers, uh, desks, you know, physical capital, that sort. This is like we're also, also all very familiar with the idea that um, there are various other intangible forms of capital, uh, human capital, you know, these the abilities of individuals, intellectual capital, or some total of human knowledge and so on. And I think we're also familiar with the idea that um, 
these in other intangible forms of capital are actually very important these days. If you look at a company like Apple, which is one of the most valuable companies in the world, it has a market capitalization of a couple of trillion dollars. Um, of that value, relatively little is made up by its physical capital assets. Its physical capital assets are probably less than 10% of that total. Most of that $2 trillion that a company like Apple is worth is in the form of intangible capital. It's human capital, the people who work in the company, the intellectual property rights of the company, and so on. So it's, um, it's not at all unusual that a very valuable asset is also somewhat intangible. Now, as an asset, natural capital biodiversity provides a flow of services over time. And we call these services ecosystem services. And these have enormous value to human societies. And I'm going to talk about the kinds of services that biodiversity provides and what their values are. So one which has already been mentioned a couple of times is pollination. Another one is carbon sequestration, very relevant to the issue of climate change. Um, the maintenance and enhancement of agricultural productivity, the product productivity of our agricultural systems owes a very, very great deal uh, to the conservation of biodiversity. Recreational value, there's a huge recreational value associated with the conservation of biodiversity. And bioprospecting, meaning prospecting for uh, pharma pharmacologically valuable compounds uh, through conserving biodiversity. And I'll talk about each of these five in a little bit of detail in the next few slides. So pollination, about one third of all the food that we eat uh, requires pollination. Uh, in fact, basically all fruit and vegetables require pollination. It's only the big grain crops that are self-pollinating. Um, so without pollinators, which are typical examples obviously of biodiversity, we would lose the, about one third of the food crops that we would eat. And the, the crops that require pollination have an annual value of roughly $217 billion. So, um, if we were to lose pollinators, for example, we would lose this amount of food, $270 billion worth of food per year, plus, of course, the consumer surpluses and the uh, Again, those of you who've got a background in economics will understand this point. The key point here is that um, although we may pay $217 billion annually for the food which is pollinated, it's actually worth an awful lot more than that to us. Uh, you may pay uh, $50 a, a day for food, uh, but um, food is actually worth an awful lot more to you than that. And if you had to, you'd pay more than that. And the difference between what you actually pay and what it's worth to you is what we call consumer surplus. The consumer surplus on food is very large indeed. Um, so when you take that into account, you can estimate that the total value of foods produced through pollination every year is around about $500 billion. So it's an annual value of about $500 billion, which we get because of pollination services provided by natural capital. Um, and if you think of this as an asset, when we can ask yourself, what's the capital value of an asset that provides a flow of services equal to $500 billion a year? And the answer to that is around $14 trillion. So you, I'm just using very standard capitalization uh, formula for this, this kind of formula that any financial institution would be totally familiar with. Um, so the value of the present discounted value of the pollination services provided by an important piece of biodiversity is around about $14 trillion. Okay. The world's insects, to put it another way, the world's insects are worth at least, uh, for, at least $14 trillion. To put that into perspective, I mentioned just now Apple, which is one of the most valuable companies in the world. That has a market cap of $2 trillion. So the world's insects are actually worth seven times Apple. Uh, the world's insects have an ec economic contribution of seven times the value of the Apple co company. Um, Apple is a very valuable company, incidentally. It's a typical so-called large capitalization company is worth uh, maybe 50 to 100 billion dollars. So the, the world's insects are worth many, many, many times uh, a typical value of a typical large cap company. Just to put that into perspective and show that this really is an important phenomenon economically. When I do these calculations, I'm leaving out of uh, consideration the fact that, uh, that we also pollinate its pollination services are on animal feedstocks, for example, alfalfa, which is fed, widely fed to cattle here in the US, requires pollination. Um, and there are a lot of wild ecosystems that also require pollination and they would die out if we lost pollinators. So you can see that that, that number $14 trillion is an estimate of the, the capital value of uh, pollinating insects is, is, is anything significant underestimate. That's just to give you a, give you a rough idea of the, the value of, of a small part of biodiversity. This has, stuff has enormous economic value. This is actually a, a cartoon which was in yesterday's issue of the New Yorker. New Yorker magazine now hiring pollinators. 
they can't run also to the idea that they're running out of pollination services. Same topic I mentioned was carbon sequestration. Um, you know, obviously, forests capture and store carbon dioxide. Uh, the whole process of growth consists of photosynthesis, where you take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, use sunlight to convert it into carbohydrates. Um, obviously, this is economically important, particularly at the current time when we're worried about uh, climate change. And you know, plenty of governments are willing to pay large sums of money uh, to people who are, willing, who are trying to be able to capture and store carbon dioxide. So this is very important economically. We can value the carbon capture and storage services of a forest uh, using what's called the social cost of carbon. And the social cost of carbon, I'm sure many, many of you are aware, is the present discounted value of the damages from the emission of an extra ton of CO2 over its lifetime in the atmosphere. And the US government does calculations of the social cost of carbon. Um, they're controversial calculations. Some people think they're too high, some people are concluding they think they're much too low. Uh, but uh, we can use work with those. Um, a hectare of moist tropical forest can capture up to 50 tons of carbon dioxide per year. Okay? Um, if we value that service, um, we, we put a value of the US government's social cost of carbon, which is about $55 a ton, on each of those 50 tons captured by a hectare of tropical forest every year. And we then take the present discounted value of that again to try to get the value of this as an asset. We come to the conclusion that the carbon capture and storage value of a hectare of tropical forest is around about $150,000. There are millions and millions of hectares of moist tropical forests. This is obviously again, a hugely valuable asset. Just looking at the carbon capture and storage services. Uh, there are obviously many, many other services that tropical forests provide as well, including of course, the, the conservation of pollinating insects that I was talking about before. Agricultural productivity. So the productivity of agriculture comes basically from the clever use of genetic variability. And we're all aware, I'm sure, that the productivity of agriculture has gone up by a factor of 10 or more in the post-Second World War period. And this comes as I said, from the clever use of genetic variability, which is a really key dimension of biodiversity. Um, we can use genetic variability both to increase productivity and also to ensure that crops remain productive once they are productive. Um, you can increase productivity by interbreeding an existing crop with other crop varieties or other plants uh, and use some of the genetic characteristics of other plants to enhance the, the uh, productivity of the initial plants. And that's essentially what has been done to produce this tenfold increase in productivity that I was referring to just now. Um, what is perhaps less widely known is the insurance value of biodiversity. And a good example of this is provided by a thing called the grassy stunt virus which is a virus that attacked the Asian rice crop back in the 1970s and early 80s. And uh, at some point it was destroying 30% of the rice crop in Asia annually. And there was a real concern that it would destroy all of its crop. Um, this virus was immune to all known pesticides. And there simply appeared to be no way of making, uh, you know, defending the rice crop against this the grassy stump virus. Ultimately, the problem was solved by only by finding a relatively rare variety of rice, uh, which was held in a seed bank at the International Rice Research Institute. And this particular variety of rice happened to be resistant to the virus. And the genes that gave resistance were then transferred to commercially used rice crops. Um, and the commercial rice crop became resistant to the virus too. Um, so that's an example of the huge importance of a relatively obscure set of genes you could find only in one particular early variety of rice, which was generally regarded as having no commercial value at all, but was maintained for historical reasons, essentially, at the International Rice Research Institute. That's again an interesting example of the uh, almost serendipitous value, a uh, huge, huge value, of a particular piece of biodiversity. And this insurance rule of biodiversity, and you can do a calculation here on what, what this is worth, it's worth about three and a half billion dollars a year, according to my calculations, giving it a capital value of around about $90 billion. Recreation. So um, you may not think of this as part of the economics of biodiversity, it's actually quite important. You know, ecotourism, you know, watching, uh, game watching safaris in Africa, going bird watching in Venezuela or Costa Rica or other parts of Central and South, South America, a generated income of around about $181 billion uh, in 2019, the last year before the, the pandemic. Uh, so almost $200 billion a year 
been generated by ecotourism. Um, and again, nature-based television shows are ubiquitous. You see them everywhere in the world all the time. And they're hugely profitable and hugely popular too. Um, so that's another aspect of the importance of biodiversity. Bioprospecting is the last topic I talked about. Let me see, go through this quickly. Um, again, another little known point is that roughly 33% by value of all the pharmaceuticals sold in the US were originally discovered in plants or animals. So the basic driving component of 33% of our pharmaceuticals were things were discovered in plants or animals, typically insects. Um, a good example, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, is aspirin. It's the most widely used painkiller in the world, the most widely used anti-inflammatory in the world, and it occurs in the bark of willow trees. And it was originally extracted from the barks of willow trees. Today, of course, it's synthesized. Um, but it's, that's an example of a naturally occurring compound that has a huge medicinal value and huge medicinal importance. More recently, a number of important cancer treatments have been derived from plants. Um, and there's a whole field of what's called bioprospecting, which is the title of this slide, which is essentially what happens in this area is that pharmaceutical companies uh, try to use traditional healing knowledge uh, to understand what kinds of plants and animals might contain molecules that are pharmacologically active and have value for derivation of drugs. Um, so little is known about this, unfortunately, but it's very difficult to reach any agreement on the value of biodiversity in this context. There are quite a lot of economic papers on bioprospecting what this tells us about the value of biodiversity, but this is a bit of a big disagreement amongst the modelers there. And so I can't really quote you a convincing figure for the, the value of biodiversity in this context. It's also true that this big problem of intellectual property rights in this area. Uh, and if you're finding, uh, for example, finding pharmacologically active molecules in developing countries, uh, who owns the property right, intellectual property rights in these? Which is something that the Lizard Moranis organization has been quite concerned about. So the bottom line here is that biodiversity is incredibly valuable economically, it has huge economic importance, but it's hard to monetize. Many, many ecosystem services are public goods, uh, they're goods which when we provide them for one person are provided to everybody. And we know very well that markets don't work well for these because of the, what economists call the classic free rider problem. You can't make money out of selling public goods, so it's hard to monetize these things. Carbon sequestration is a classic global public good. It would take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere stabilizing the climate for everybody in the world, not just for people locally. Agricultural support, you know, the knowledge that we get from biodiversity, which enhances agriculture and ensures agriculture, that's a classic public good because knowledge is a classic public um, Again, bioprospecting is finding knowledge. And as I said, knowledge is a classic public good. So it should be shared with many people without mentioning my, my understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, Pollination. Uh, this is interesting. There is some potential for privatizing pollination. I mean, here in the US, for example, there are actually private pollination, pollination operations. So if you are here in New York, uh, I'm in New York at the moment. Uh, New York is known as the Big Apple. Uh, and it's known as the Big Apple because there's a lot of apple farms in upstate New York. And those apple farms have to be pollinated every year. Uh, Unfortunately, the native pollinators in New York have died out more or less, so you can't rely on native pollinators to pollinate your apple crop if you're an apple farmer. So apple farmers actually hire pollination services. And there are a group of organizations in Texas that, uh, um, that essentially are bee farms, and they move these farms around the country in response to demand. And so apple farmers in New York hire the Texas bee farmers to bring their bees up to New York to pollinate the apple crop for part of the year. They then go on to California to pollinate the, the almond crop and a few other things like that. So you are beginning to see the emergence of a, pollinate, of a private market in pollination to compensate, compensate for the fact that we have destroyed most of the native pollinators here in the US. Ecotourism is a bit different. Ecotourism is a, is a field, is an aspect of biodiversity where it is possible to make money, but it's fairly directly from the species conservation. I'll talk more about that in a second. How do financial markets deal with this? Financial markets do have a role to play in trying to monetize the benefits, converting public to private goods. Um, there's two ways in which they can do this. One is through using a cap and trade system, and the other is through what I call bundling public and private goods together. And the third one, which is possibly of interest, is the payment for ecosystem services, which is a system which has been introduced in a number of countries, and in particular quite extensively in Costa Rica. 
A cap and trade system, what's this? Well, we place a limit on the emission of pollutants in the most existing cap and trade system, that would be SO2, sulfur dioxide, or carbon dioxide. And we require a permit for the emission of one of these pollutants. And these permits are not tradable to the market price on permits. The pollutant in this case is a public bad. Uh, it's destroying a public good, atmospheric quality. And if the cap is tight enough, it can lead to the optimal provision of this public good the optimal control of public bad. And there are lots of examples of these. The European Union has this so-called emission trading system for controlling the emission of carbon dioxide. California has something very similar. In fact, the whole of the west coast of the United States has a, an emission trading system for CO2 emissions. Here in the Northeast, there's a greenhouse gating, trade gas trading system. And China is supposedly introducing a greenhouse gas trading system sometime this year. So the cap and trade system is quite widely used. <coughs> um, and um, investment firms are often large-scale players in these markets once the markets are sufficiently liquid. And the permit price, the key thing about these things is the permit price provides an incentive to reduce emissions and to develop offsets. The permit price in particular can provide an incentive to conserve tropical forests, for example, because tropical forests actually are removing CO2. So if we link the permit markets to the conservation of tropical forests and the removal of CO2 from the atmosphere, outside of the geographically affected region, uh, we can provide incentives for, for forest conservation and therefore for biodiversity conservation through cap and trade systems. We can imagine also a cap and trade system direct, directly for biodiversity, but we don't actually have one in place at the moment. Bundling, what's bundling? Um, so think about wildlife safaris in Africa. So what attracts the customers is biodiversity. Uh, you know, people go on, by, on, on wildlife safaris in Kenya or in, in Southern Africa because they want to see lions, elephants, cheetahs, uh, deer, and so on. But that's actually not what they're paying for. What they're actually paying for is hotels, meals, tour guides. And they're paying very, very fancy prices for these indeed. I believe that some of these high-end safaris, people are paying you know, $500 to $1,000 a day uh, for the hotels and the meals and so on. They clearly wouldn't pay these rates if it were not for the animals. So what's happening here is that biodiversity, which is a public good, enhances the value of private goods, like hotel rooms and guiding services and so on. Um, so by bundling the two together, you can get a, a hugely increased value for your, for your private goods. But the biodiversity of the public good is the, is the crucial thing there. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this gives obviously a clear incentive for the conservation of biodiversity. And we see actually a significant increase and the resources devoted to biodiversity conservation in the parts of Africa, where there is an active ecotourism operation. And green products in general doing the same, that bundling are real or in some cases imaginary considerations for this with private goods. Payment for ecosystem services just means charging for the private goods that biodiversity provides. So for example, sometimes biodiversity is important in providing clean water. You can charge for the water. It's important in providing what are called non timber forest products, products that come out of forests like nuts and light yarns and so on, that have a market value but are not part of the forest the timber itself. Timber, of course, can be sustainably harvested. And recreation services. These are all services provided by biodiversity in forests, and we can charge for these. We can charge for bioprospecting too. Um, this is a bit like bundling, when the public will provide the associated value of private goods. We come from it. Again, it gives it an incentive to conserve biodiversity. Here's one slide very briefly on macroeconomics and biodiversity. Natural capital, which is what we're talking about here, is often one of the primary drivers in early stages of economic development. So natural capital is very important indeed as a source of value in developing countries. And it's also often a major asset of indigenous populations, whose traditional lifestyles are very, very heavily dependent on biodiversity. Some of the first people to suffer from loss of biodiversity are frequently indigenous populations. The crop failures, which can occur from the loss of biodiversity, and I mentioned the failure of the rice crop in Asia uh, three or four yeah. years ago, yeah. usually yeah. have big macroeconomic implications, leading to famine, the need for import food, trade deficits, and so on. Uh, again, nature tourism can be an important source of revenue for an exchange. It doesn't require any up heavy upfront investment. So, my conclusions. Biodiversity really matters economically. It's very, very important economically, but it's difficult to see. It's difficult to understand the importance of biodiversity intuitively. It's hard to see, it's hard to measure, it's hard to monetize, which makes it a classic public good. 
there are financial mechanisms that can provide incentives for conservation of biodiversity, but in many ways, they're still under development. And finally, we just go apply to my book, Endangered Economies, How Neglected Nature Threatens Our Prosperity, which develops all these points I've been talking about in a lot more detail. So thank you very much for the organizational meeting, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Absolutely. Thank you very much, Jeff, for your excellent presentation um, and, and for your valuable contributions. Uh, because of the problems uh, of the microphone, I couldn't introduce Jeff properly. He's a professor of social enterprise at Columbia Business School and is very noted for his contributions to economic theory and resource and environmental economics. He has taught in some of the best universities in the world, Sussex, Essex, Yale, Stanford, Ecole Polytechnique, Stockholm, and Princeton. And he's written about 18 books and about 200 articles. He was a coordinating lead author of the IPCC's fifth assessment report and a member of President Sarkozy's commission on measurement of economic performance and social progress. Again, thank you very much, Jeff. And it's now my great pleasure to, uh, uh, to introduce Mattis Walkernagel, who's co-founder and president of the Global Footprint Network and is the co-creator of the Ecological Footprint. Mr. Walkernagel previously served as director of the Sustainability Program at Redefining Progress in Oakland, California, and ran the Centro Estudios para Sustentabilidad in Chalapa, Mexico. He has a number of important awards, including the World Sustainability Award and the Global Award for the Environment. Matis, the, the floor is yours and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephanie. <clears throat> Thank you, Banco Central de Chile for taking on this important topic and so, so well for this great conference. I much appreciate and thank you, Elizabeth, also for putting the more global context and biodiversity uh, towards us and also um, and Jeffrey obviously explaining um, the key economic dimension of biodiversity. I would love uh, just to build on what Jeff just told us and we share the screen right now. So let me see if it works. I think it should work. So you should be able to see it now. Um, talking about bio biological regeneration and economic performance. And just before I start, let me just tell you the three messages I would like to uh, bring about. So first is building exactly in what Jeff said. Biodiversity alone obviously is infinitely valuable. Without it, we would be dead. Uh, but still the market incentives may be too weak if we just look at biodiversity as a single issue. But the good news is if we bundle biodiversity with many other of the environmental issues, suddenly it becomes actually economically viable. And we can also measure that, that's what I wanna show. And then also give some economic examples to what extent actually, even today, I believe, incentives are strong enough to act. Of course, more incentives would be better, but they're already strong enough. Now, let me just get to the chase. Because I would say the following, the future has never been more predictable than today. That doesn't mean we know everything. We know that people who want to eat they will want to sleep, they will want to have a great time, they want to move around, etc. And we also know that there will be more climate change and fewer ecological resources, and also eventually no use of fossil fuels. We all know that. In any imaginable scenario, it will be different distributed if we move faster out of fossil fuels, but then if we don't move faster out of fossil fuels, we'll have more climate change and less ecological resources, etc. There's all it's coming as a package. So by knowing that the future will be defined by climate change and ecological resource scarcity, and by using far fewer uh, uh, fossil fuels, it becomes quite obvious that if you don't prepare yourself for that future, you will have a huge disadvantage. And that shows kind of the economic story I would like to get into. But first, let me explain to you why we can be so clear about the future we're moving into and how we can measure it. Essentially. The main driver we see today is that today we have become very large. And when I say we, I mean humanity has become very large compared to the size of the biosphere. Even larger than the biosphere to some extent. 
And that makes this the changes that makes the rules change of how the economy operates. That's what some people call the Anthropocene. Now, what do we mean large compared to the, to the biosphere? Because some studies have shown we have reached planetary boundaries. What does that mean? Essentially, there are all these conditions that are necessary to support life. And they are identified also by planetary boundaries and others and the ecological services. And they all enable regeneration. The regeneration is the food source for everything else. Biomass regeneration powered by photosynthesis allows regeneration. And we would make the case that regeneration is materially now the most limiting factor. And of course, for regeneration, you also need biodiversity. So what do we mean by that? Biological assets are needed for food, for fiber, for wood, but also a competing use of bio regeneration is absorption of CO2 because fossil fuels are much more limited by how much the biosphere can absorb than what's underground. And also mineral extraction. In the end, we can dig deeper, but that takes energy. Energy often comes with impact on the biosphere, whether it's fossil fuel emissions or um, just digging holes from, from mines, etc. So all these things in the end are competing for the, re the limited regeneration of the planet. Now, just to make it more specific, what we mean by that regeneration or biocapacity is the photosynthesis powered by the sun that enables regeneration. It occurs in surfaces, whether forests, pastures, croplands, etc. cetera. Uh, it's measured in a number of different ways, whether it's kind of the yield, we call it biocapacity. And it's so essential because plant matters feed every value chain, whether it's non-food, uh, it's non-plant life, or any economic activity, which is part of the human life. <clears throat> now, when we recognize that regeneration is a limiting factor, the big question becomes how much regeneration do we have? How much regenera regeneration do we use? And that's what we actually can measure. I will just go quickly towards it first by looking at first the regeneration. Here a map of how regeneration happens around the world by season, it's like a pumping heart. Uh, so, it, 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 so seasonal areas, like North, uh, Northern Europe, they disappear in the winter, et cetera. This is the, the force of nature that gives us regeneration. Or if you make it more static, about 24% of the world's surface is ecologically highly productive. That's where we harvest things. And so we can say then, if we, num we, we, we divide that productive area by number of people on the planet, we have about 1.6, we call them global hectares, on our planet. That's what we have available. 1.6 average hectares, and we also share them with biodiversity. Now, I call them global hectares because not every hectare is equally productive. So we scale them proportional to the productivity. And we can do then the same thing on demand. What does it take to provide everything you use for food, waste absorption, timber, CO2 absorption, obviously, for the city space, etc.? How much do we occupy right now? 2.75 global hectares, so more than what's available. How is that possible? We can use nature more rapidly. We can use regeneration more rapidly than actually it regenerates, thereby dipping into the natural capital stock. And when we look at the ratio last year between how much we use compared to how much nature can renew, we estimated with, with conservative numbers from the UN that we used about 73% more humanity and what's available on the planet. And if you used everything, there wouldn't be enough space for wild species either. So the ideal is not to use the entire planet, but certainly not more than one planet. We can also translate that in time by using 1.73 fold. What we use is like using 1.73 Earth, which obviously we don't have. That means it leads to depletion. We can also translate it into a budget number and say between January 1st and July 29th last year, we used as much as Earth can renew in the entire year. It's a budget question. You can over, overspend, but not forever. Now, when we look at the issue of biodiversity, there are really five key drivers, distinct drivers that drive down biodiversity. And IPBS even put numbers behind them to say how much it's driven the last 50 years by each of the five areas, land use change, overuse, climate change, pollution, and invasive species. Now, the future will make that distribution very, very different. Climate change hasn't been an influential in the past, but will be far more influential over time 
in, in, in biodiversity loss. Invasive species, also they're like more exponential. Once they're introduced, they don't go away that easily. So they may also become much more significant, et cetera. But it shows it's about these five issues and all five issues are driven largely by overuse of nature. That's, gonna, that's called overshoot. If you overuse, all these five things are driven largely. Now, that means if we don't address the big quantity issue of human metabolism compared to the size of the economy, it's very difficult to scale quality improvements because we just, we, we can't, we, if we just save one piece and then the whole demand gets moved somewhere else, there's no net gain. If you look at it nation by nation, we can see many countries use significantly more, that's the red number, uh, the red countries than what they have available for regeneration in their own country. You can go to data.footprintnetwork.org to look at each country over time. And actually one key number to remember is the following. 72%, we just pay published that in nature, 72% of the world of, of the world population live in countries that both both live in a country with an ecological deficit, meaning they use more than the country can renew, and have less than world average income, means that they cannot get the extra through trading from other places because they cannot outcompete financially. The others, 72% are in that situation. So obviously, there's economic impact and economic challenge. And still, there's what I would call the pinker paradox that some I think rightly point out that many things are going right. If you look at longevity, it's increasing, has been increasing for quite a long time. If you look at human development, has been increasing in most countries, in spite of the backlashes that we've seen through the pandemics and the wars, et cetera, that are seeming to be emerging again. But are they all getting better? And I think it's helpful to see the two different axes that make sustainable development happen. We want to live better. That's called development. At the same time, there's only so much planet. And if you do actually dots and say, how well do countries do, or we could do it for every person, and use the human development index as the horizontal and say, like, how well are you doing? And then also look at how many Earth would it take if everybody lived like you? You can put a dot on this diagram. And the blue square at the bottom shows where we actually would like to be. That means less using less than one planet. Uh, Your Wilson said perhaps half Earth we should use, and then have a high human development, which the UN called 0.8 or higher. That's the blue part. Now, the tragedy today is that the movement is going along the red axis. And even when you look at the SDGs, we did a paper about that, the SDGs still drive the dots along the red arrow. What we would need to do to have a successful future is to run the arrow in this direction. And this is a direct application. We work with a number of companies and investors to say the following. Companies who help their clients move in the green direction of the arrow that I show right now, they just will have a much higher chance in the future to be viable because they can provide services that are used in a way that reduces overshoot. So the key question for investors is, will this company, if it doubles, reduce humanity's overshoot or increase it? If it reduces, the likelihood of this company becoming more valuable is much higher than the other way around. That shows there's actually already invest from an investment perspective, thinking about these constraints directly translates into helping you to pick what kind of companies are more likely to generate value than others who will just be stuck not being able to operate by depending on too many resources. So all I'm telling you is this is all about context. It's not about burden. By understanding the forces of nature more clearly, you can make better decisions. So what are the strategies you need to succeed? And I would just give just one example to conclude here. And it's the following. Here I show you my life. I was born in 1962. Here it starts actually from 1961. So bio capacity as measured by the UN data set, it uses about 15,000 data points per country and year. Um, it's very production oriented, it seems to be increasing because yields of agriculture have been increasing and, and depletion hasn't been measured so well. So probably it's an overestimate, but still with the UN data, it looks like there's more being regenerated on the planet. That's the green line. But the red line shows how we have been using more and more for human demand, for humanity. 
and it wriggles a little bit, often related to economic crises, etc. And so the issue really is not just how much bigger you are, but the accumulation of deficit over time. So the pink area really reflects the ecological debt we have accumulated over time. And this debt now has led to a CO2 and greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere that is committing us, we can debate it, but according to actually, if you look at the science, to probably a two degrees Celsius path at least already today with the CO2 in the, and the methane and the other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Now, the question is, where will we go? Nobody knows where we will go, you know? But um, some hope, oh, it's going to just kind of continue as we have for the last 50 years. What was wrong about the last 50 years? All the progress, longevity, everything. But if you actually look at the physical implications of such a business as usual situation, the, econo the ecological debt that would be accumulated becomes impossible. So a more likely situation, maybe, or more another situation that still leads to more climate change, the IPCC 1.5 degree scenario, and still we would add more ecological debt, but much less. And I don't know which path we will take, but essentially it will probably be something wobbly, you know, in between that leads to a lot of shocks. So it just shows the resource situation, the ecological regeneration context will become a major force. And that's not seen currently by the financial markets because we pay so little for natural capital. But if you look at it physically, it's quite dramatic. Now, if you overlay that with the length of investments, if you invest in something, it's not just a paper, it's a factory, it's an energy system, it's a house, it's people being born today, it's infrastructure, it's factories, et cetera. So if you look at all these things, they have a long lifespan. They will have to operate mostly in a totally different future. And the question, and that's in itself not bad or good, that's just what is. There are time delays in the system. If you invest in things that will be able to operate well in that future, you buy yourself into a much easier future. If you invest in things that are more likely running into walls and difficulties, you are making yourself frail. So there's a much clearer link between economic long-term value creation and sustainability than we typically hear in the normal narrative. Because there's this double risk, and that's the last point I'm gonna make. The double risk is not only are we going to lose value if we invest in the wrong things, if we invest in assets that don't operate well in a world with climate change and resource constraints, we will lose value. But even worse probably is we will lose that value at the time when the economy is weak. So it's like when you fall down and you thought there was a mattress on the floor and as you fall, the mattress is being pulled away. So it's not just a value loss, which is bad for you and society at large. It's losing it at the worst time when we actually need these assets. So this is why I believe even today, not in a current like cost benefit quick analysis, but if you look at long term value generation, if you look at investment strategies, not to prepare yourself for the predictable future of climate change and resource constraints is economically highly irrational. With that, I would like to go back to the three messages and hope they have been able to get across to say that, yes, obviously, biodiversity alone is infinitely valuable, but the market is not seeing the value sufficiently enough. And that's, I think, what Jeffrey showed us very well, as well in his great presentation. But if we bundle biodiversity with the other functions of nature, that biodiversity is a key part for regeneration. If we look at regeneration and to what extent we are exposed to constraints uh, that now the market doesn't see, we recognize that like the country where I come from originally, Switzerland uses four and a half times more than its own ecosystems can renew. And in the Netherlands, it's sevenfold more, for example. In China, it's three times more than what China, China can regenerate. If you don't see that as an economic risk in the world that's moving towards using more resources and making more demands on nature, uh, it, 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 it just is, it's not just short-sighted, it's actually putting your current assets at risk. That's what I wanted to show with the example of saying, if we truly are an overshoot, and if truly your investments have a longer time span because they're linked to physical decisions of a power plant or a house or a, um, a factory or a, a, a marketing strategy, which also take time. If that's not taking into account, 
the predictable future, you may make very poor bets. With that, I will conclude and congratulate again, because in the end, I think banks who think about financial stability of countries, recognizing that we live in a totally new context, the Anthropocene with new rules and new, and, 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 and new dynamics, it's a very timely thing to look at. And I look forward to the, the discussions that come out of this great conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Matthias. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much to you and to um, Elizabeth and who gave us such an inspiring call and, and of course to Jeffrey. So I, I think we've been really privileged to have such three wonderful speakers, um, uh, which I think are kicking us off in a wonderful way. I want to, especially with the last presentation, it, it, it is, I think, very striking that there are massive distributional issues, both between countries and within countries, because to make the planet uh, consistent, uh, both in terms of biodiversity loss and climate change, I think uh, there have to be some limits, and as well as change in direction, uh, of production, um, but there also, I think, has to be important redistributional implications to, to, to satisfy the sort of basic needs uh, of uh, many people in the planet who still don't have electricity, some of them don't even have food. Um, so um, it, it would be great if, if the three panelists could make and particularly maybe Mattis uh, could make some comment on that. And beside that, I have some additional questions. Um, but maybe if, if you could make a comment on this distribution issue first, that would be great. Absolutely. And uh, so what we do is we provide measurements to actually show that difference around the world. It's mapping what is. And that's why also we believe like with 72% of the world population living in countries that have an ecological deficit and not the GDP to compete with the others to get more, this shows how fragile the situation is and not addressing resource security becomes an anti-poverty stance, I would say. I just remember conversations we had with the Ecuador government because I believe it, I simplify from the outside, but there's this kind of common development theory in, in Latin America that some people called el derecho al desarrollo. So, and and, the, and it's a, to simplify, I simplify them to the outside, which is, oh, let's just liquidate our ecological assets. And once we have money, we'll be like the Swiss who don't have resources either. And then we have lots of money and everything will be fine. I'm simplifying. But still, when we were in Ecuador and had this conversation, we showed them, and you can look at data.footprintnetwork.org, how much biocapacity Ecuador had per person compared to how much they used back in the 60s, they had five times more Ecuador than they used themselves. By now, the two lines have come close. There are more Ecuadorians sharing Ecuador, so there's less Ecuador per person. There is uh, more consumption per person, so that's went up as well. And so they're now actually they're nearly running into an ecological deficit. When they saw the curve, some people said, you must be contra el derecho al desarrollo. You must be against the right to develop. And we said, absolutely not. We want to have the best lives for everybody. That's why we exist. But what you're pursuing is a derecho al colapso. It doesn't really help you because you don't have the money to get the extra resources. And if you use up the resources, you're in a very delicate position. And if actually, if you looked at the Ecuador situation, by selling all the future rights to resources, it's a, it's a very delicate situation. So we are shifting the situation. Ecuador, actually, we were very proud. We didn't give them any money. We didn't bribe them or anything. You know? <laughs> they just said, wow, we need to move out of an ecological deficit. This is not good for us. So they started to recognize the self-interest. It's not a moral obligation. It's an obligation to their own well-being. And so that's why we call it now much more, we say, el poder ecologico, because Latin America, actually South America, not so Latin America, Central America is much tighter, but South America really from the world perspective, has el poder ecologico, that the, the ecological resource asset is the key to long-term competitiveness. And not recognizing that in a world that's overshooting more and more is just not taking advantage of the great 
privilege that South America has. And so I think seeing that as a true asset and, and managing it well, rather than just liquidating for the, for the quick return, that needs to be at the core of any development strategy. Thank you very much. I don't know if uh, Elizabeth Jeff or to, Jeff would like Jeff wants to say something. <laughs> um, well, no, I just wanted to, to uh, first of all, I really enjoyed your talk, Mathis. Um, and to, Thanks, sort of, to say what he was saying in a slightly different way, which is that um, this concept of excessive use of the ecological capacity, in, in my sort of language, that, what that really amounts to is we're depleting natural capital. You know, the countries come into existence with a certain endowment of natural capital. And the process of economic development so far has tended to be we build up physical capital, we build up human capital, but we run down natural capital to the point where it's a really very low, 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 low spot in the capital indeed. And that has distribution implications, to take your point, Stephanie, because as I mentioned, it's often the poorer communities and indigenous people in particular who are very heavily dependent on the services of natural capital. I mean, everybody is dependent to some degree, but they are particularly heavily dependent. So that process of development can have a very natural negative impact on the people in the lowest income groups. I think that's a very important point. Is, is Elizabeth still with us? I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, maybe she's had to leave. No, um, I'm still with No. Oh, so I, I look forward to your insights on this, on the <laughs> distributive implications. Sorry? If you have any further comments on the concerns about distribution, income distribution, and 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 these limits to the planet. Income distribution will always remain a major issue, particularly to developing countries. Okay. And we know, I mean, the whole issue of uh, the that even as nature is being lost, is lost differently in different regions. And therefore, when it comes to uh, the loss is different, the impacts are different, the recovery uh, initiatives are equally different, which of course they were cost. And it depends how then each country is able to cover that cost for restoration. So indeed that will remain a concern and particularly for developing countries. Thank you very much. So I have here some questions from the audience. Oh, sorry, Mattis, do you want to add something? Distribution is an incredibly important issue and I have great hopes if we're done well, that now particularly through the carbon markets, if done well, it is possible to bring significant resources to ecological restoration. I'm involved in one of the projects and, and like one of the principles we apply is to say, when we do carbon projects, we wanna make sure that at least 60% of the retirement money, so it actually it's not just sold to the market, but when the carbon credit is retired, has to go back to the country of origin to help pay for the, for, for, like for the communities, but also to build the scientific capacity, to build the capacity of those countries to actually be able to, to market their own ecological services. Because the, 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 the prices that we see right now for carbon, they're so ridiculous. And what's actually the margin that goes now to communities that live in these areas, whether mangroves or reforestation areas, is so small that it exacerbates inequities. But I think if we build good markets and put really good principles into those markets, it's possible to help to drive true development that actually is also building ecological resist resilience. And so I think Jeff's work with ecological services is, is, is so important. I think that's something just is newly emerging. We see it also now with even bio, biodiversity credits being kind of starting to be conceptualized, obviously much more complex than, mm -hmm. than, than carbon credits. But there is a huge opportunity, but we need to get it right. Otherwise, it could, could lead to another bleeding. I think that's a very important element. But of course, you need where there are market failures, as Jeff was saying, uh, we also need public mechanisms that will help. I now have some other questions. Uh, given the existence of nonlinearities, complementarities, and tipping points in the evolution of biodiversity and ecosystem services, how do you think is the relative urgency of undertaking actions in these dimensions with respect to climate change? That's to Jeffrey and to Mattis and to Elizabeth, the Paris Agreement has been a game changer in the urgency of halting forest loss and habitat loss 
and governments are taking action by implementing extensive policies, measures to meet national development targets. What is the expectation you have or should, what should we expect from the new global diversity framework to be this game changer for biodiversity? Uh, and then there's a final one uh, for Elizabeth also and Jeffrey. In COP26, Special Envoy Mark Carney repeatedly highlighted the vast amounts uh, of, sorry, the vast amounts of uh, private money that would be willing to invest in climate and environmental transition. He talked about 130 trillion US dollars. On the other hand, as mentioned by Elizabeth, budgets for conservation are tiny in the order of tens of billions at the aggregate level. How can we bridge this enormous gap? This is a difficult question. In particular, how can we reshape our standard practice of approaching nature as conservation or limited spaces through donations towards an approach that incorporates broader ecosystem valuation in public and private investment decisions? Can you illustrate with recent examples in leading countries pioneering the natural capital approach? And the last, this question was made by Elias Alivari, who's one of the main organizers of this conference. So the floor is yours. Sorry, I, I read you three questions. So for, we should start with the first one, um, which was to Jeffrey and Mattis about the non-linearities. Well, it's an important topic. Um, it's a very complex one too. Uh, and the <clears throat> key thing here is that um, you've got a bunch of different ecosystems that interact with each other. And it's actually quite difficult to predict how the, the system as a whole will change when you change one, of, one part of it. Um, I think really that, that, to cut a fairly long story short, and maybe Mattis has something more interesting to say on this, but it, it, it argues for a very precautionary approach. Um, can, we can make changes which can be, appear to be relatively small, which can destroy the whole system. And uh, that's, I think, the thing we need to be aware of. Um, that's true of any system which has a sort of potential for phase changes. The same thing is true actually the climate system. And we're very concerned about a number of potential tipping points for the climate system, which could lead to major changes in the US climate uh, in response to, for example, the release of uh, greenhouse of, of, of methane, methane clathrates frozen in the north and things like that. So there's a number of tipping points like this, each of which could potentially lead to very large changes in the Earth's habitability. Uh, <clears throat> and um, essentially, because we don't understand them, we don't quite know where they are, because the consequences can be very dangerous, it argues for a highly precautionary approach. And then that's one of the justifications, I think, for worrying about one and a half degrees, as opposed to two degrees or two and a half degrees. And maybe Masters has more, more to say on this. That's it. Straight with Jeff. Thank you so thank you so much. I mean, tipping points could make the situation even more dramatic. And if we even just assumed total linearity and reversibility, which is not the case, currently human demand exceeds what Earth can renew at at least 70%. And if you follow E.O. Wilson, who said we should use half a planet to maintain 85% of biodiversity. So compared half a planet with 1.7 planets, that's about over threefold material difference. And we're not even able to address that well. And then comes the complication with tipping points. So I think directionally, we know exactly where you need to go. We need to dematerialize dramatically. And dematerialize is not just as a burden. That's why I rather talk not just about you need to reduce. I say the same thing differently. I say you need to increase your resource security. Because also journalists, they ask me, oh, how are you reducing your footprint? I say, actually, that's not that helpful to reduce my footprint. Much more helpful to think, how do I increase my own resource security? Because then I realize I invest in myself. I think that's what countries haven't understood yet. They still think they're making a great gift to humanity and they're they're weakening themselves. It's the exact opposite. It's the most significant investment they can make into themselves to prepare themselves for the predictable future. So it's not a giving up yourself. It's actually investing in yourself. And if tipping points would be on top of that, then go even faster. But we don't even go fast enough if they even burn any tipping points. <clears throat> That's the strange thing. And it's actually a very uneconomical behavior right now. It's driven by a, no by a narrative, a mindset that is not aligned with the physical reality we live in. 
That's very clear. Thank you very much, Jeff okay. and Mathis. And Elizabeth, could you reply, please, to the question about the Paris Agreement uh, and how yes. we could get equ equivalent responses? Indeed, that's the intention that the development of the post 2020 global biodiversity framework will lead into a Paris agreement like for nature. The negotiations are still going on. The next uh, actually negotiation by governments will take place in Nairobi end of June. Uh, and hopefully by then more progress will be made on that document, at least to be able to reduce the many brackets currently in the draft document. But what is important to, uh, to, to, to take note, the draft uh, framework currently already take into account its contribution to the implementation of the Paris Agreement, specifically, I think, draft target eight. So uh, in other words, it recognizes the intrinsic link and connection between climate change and biodiversity loss. So for climate change, uh, to, uh, for us to be able to deal with climate change, it means also simultaneously have to deal also with the loss of biodiversity. Not surprising that statistics show about 37% of climate mitigation will come from nature or nature-based solutions. So the two needs to be looked at in a more harmonious uh, that solutions to other will have core benefit to the other and vice versa. And this is fully recognized in the development of the uh, framework going on. But we have to see what kind of nature of the document we will have finally. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if you could also comment, and perhaps Jeffrey as well this time, about this issue of the gaps, you know, the, the commitment of these, all these 130 trillion US dollars for the private capital, but also uh, how in practice the budgets for conservation are tiny and how we can reshape the practice of approaching uh, nature's conservation of limited spaces. If probably I can respond in the context of the ongoing uh, uh, development of the post 2020 framework, it is expected that the framework will also be adopted with the resource mobilization strategy. That is one. It is also the question of finance for its implementation is one of, I would say, uh, divergent issues. You have countries, particularly developing world, already calling for uh, asking to be assured that there will be funds for implementation. So this is high on the agenda and actually, uh, and will continue to be high on the agenda moving forward. We have had, for instance, uh, bodies like uh, the United Nations Environment Program, uh, the UN Development Program and Global Environmental Facility already put funds to uh, assist developing countries with the preparation of their national implementation uh, in readiness for the implementation of the framework when it is adopted. So to already begin preparing uh, for that and not waste time when the implementation, I mean, when the framework is adopted. Uh, and then of course, within the framework, it's looking at uh, the ability, particularly to be able to repurpose and redirect uh, over 50, $500 billion of harmful subsidies spent every year into uh, sustainable nature positive uh, outcomes or activities. And if then that is uh, able to be fulfilled, again, it means those are resources, hopefully to be repurposed into nature positive. So there are these different uh, initiatives, mechanisms on the way. It doesn't mean it is enough. So more will still be needed. And this is what part of the discussions as we move on. Thank you very much. I think it's very important the point you made, plus also the point you made in your initial presentation about the massive task of aligning both public and private finance to meet these objectives and all the important work that has to be done both by private sector 
and financial regulators and governments to, uh, to, to help channeling and aligning these massive resources. <laughs> Can I make a couple of comments on that point? I think it's very important. Yes, yeah. we're actually out of time, but please, Jeff, it's yeah, always important quickly. what you have to say. Um, first of all, I think Mark Khan is over-optimistic. I haven't seen much of that $134 trillion yet. Uh, so I think that we should take that with a, I'm afraid, a pinch of salt. And I'd be great if it's true, but um, I, I haven't seen, nobody's seen much of that yet. Second thing, a very quick point, is that I think climate change is a much more investable topic than biodiversity conservation. You can invest in solar power, you can invest in, in wind, wind turbines, you can invest in energy storage. At the moment, we haven't got so much tangible stuff that we can invest in, which is related directly to biodiversity conservation. Uh, and, and thirdly, um, the, um, a lot of the investment for climate change is going to have to be in developing countries. Um, and the $134 billion, trillion dollars that Mark mentioned, if, if indeed that's true, is money which is available in the West. It's not clear to me at all that that money is actually available for investment in developing countries. And there's a, a bunch of political issues associated with getting Western funds to invest in developing countries. And um, that's something we haven't really thought about it nearly enough, is how do we structure investment opportunities so that the money, which is largely in the West, actually has an incentive to go to developing countries, whereas the financial institutions are a bit underdeveloped and where there are a range of sort of risks which are somewhat different from the risks that one is used to taking in Western investments. And I think this is, a, I think, a, a very big issue both for climate and for biodiversity. Thank you. I, thank think, you more I thank you so much for this point because I think it's absolutely crucial. Maybe we need a new international financial architecture, as economists like to call it, which will help precisely catalyze private flows and I share completely your skepticism about these vast amounts that, that Mark Khan is saying it would be nice if we were there, but I, I am very skeptical. Uh, uh, but then whatever there is, how to help encourage and channel it to, to developing and emerging countries, but also to how to supplement it with public resources, philanthropic resources and others. Because I think it, it, the private finance will not be enough. And also, I think your, your very valuable point that this is much more difficult for biodiversity than for, say, climate change, where we already know much of the investment that needs to be done, yeah. okay, for example, in, green, in clean energy, but also in other areas. Um, and I would actually, Chile has a great potential, if I can do a little add. So we have all this lithium and potential for green hydrogen and so on to contribute. Um, but um, I think these are very important points. So thank you again very much for a really, really very insightful uh, start to the conference. Thank you. It's wonderful. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you for joining us. Thank Thanks, you very Steph. much. Elizabeth. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you so much to all the panelists for being part of this first session. Now we are now we are moving to a short 10 minute break and then we will continue with session two, uh, measuring biodiversity, ecosystem degradation and natural capital. And this will be at uh, 10.40. So please uh, stay connected or come back in 10 minutes to continue with the next uh, session. And uh, see you in, in, in 10 minutes. Thank you.
listed in the left side of the menu bar. So let me now to pass the floor to Mr. Pablo Garcia, Vice Governor of the Central Bank of Chile, who will be the moderator of our second panel. Pablo, thank you very much, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Daniela. It is a great pleasure to uh, be moderating the second session of our conference on measuring biodiversity, ecosystem degradation, and uh, natural capital. Uh, one of the first tasks that we need to undertake to, un to enhance our understanding of how economic and human development interact with nature is essentially to be able to measure and value the goods and services that are provided by nature and that sustain and fulfill human life. Uh, how these metrics are developed and how can they inform economic analysis and policy is the subject also of our session. And we have, I'm very pleased to, to, to say that we have three extremely distinguished speakers that will inform us and illuminate us on, this, on these issues. Um, first, we have uh, Mr. Pushpan uh, Kumar. He is the Chief Environmental Economist at the United Nations Environment, uh, Environment Program. Uh, he has a doctoral degree in environmental and ecological economics, and he has taught in India, the UK, and in the USA. Uh, he regularly conducts training programs on uh, these issues. He has published in uh, numerous articles uh, in peer-reviewed journals such as Science, Nature, and Lancet, and he has a number of other, other of publications and other, other, other roles. Uh, we then have uh, Ms. Gretchen Daly, she is, uh, Ms. Daly is the director of the Center for Conservation Biology at Stanford, and she's the co-founder and the faculty director of the Stanford Natural Capital Project. Uh, Ms. Daly uh, has all, is also a fellow of the U.S. National Academy of Science, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the American Philosophical Society. She holds a PhD and a master's degree in biological sciences from Stanford, and she also has uh, worked and published extensively on this on this issue. That, Interest. And finally, we have uh, Pablo Marquette. He's a professor of, uh, of the Department of Ecology at the University, at uh, the Catholic University of Chile. He also is an external professor at the Santa Fe Institute and is associated with the Institute of Ecology and Biodiversity. Uh, he has a PhD in biology from the University of New Mexico and uh, he has uh, published extensively also on this, on this issue. So uh, we will follow the same format as, as other panels. Each speaker will have uh, between 20 and 25 minutes for their presentation. Uh, we will go in the same order that, that I, I, I presented them. And then we, at the end, uh, we have uh, about 10 minutes for uh, Q&A. So Pushpam, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. And can you see my slides? They are being shared, so... I think we can wait a minute here. Yeah, it, it looks like it should be fine now. Can you see the slides? Yes. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Mr. De Silva. Uh, very happy to be in this panel and uh, uh, after an excellent discussion uh, uh, where we had executive secretary of CBD uh, and Professor Jeffrey Hale and Mathis, I think my task is a lot more easier. Uh, uh, they have given a nice background and the landscape, including the technicalities involved in, uh, in, in how to bring biodiversity laws into financial and economic models and stability. So what I'm going to do in this next 20 minutes to, to, to focus that how some of the operations of the banks, like Central Bank of Chile, can recognize, embrace, and internalize natural capital into their operations. Uh, uh, two things we have to keep in mind. Uh, we use GDP, gross domestic product, for various ratio analysis in the banking operations. Uh, and that is good. But uh, we have to keep in mind that if the purpose is sustainability, if the purpose is measuring well-being, 
and progress, I think GDP had its limitations. And this has been discussed in last few decades, uh, uh, not only since 1970, but just from the beginning of the GDP concept after World War II, people never imagined that this measure of the flow called gross domestic product will, will be used to measure sustainability, how a country is doing, how much progress they have achieved. Uh, that seems to be a kind of overstretching the use of GDP. GDP does many good things, and I'm not going to question that. Being a macroeconomist myself, I understand the role and relevance of GDP. But to measure sustainability, uh, I think it has limitations. So what I'm going to uh, so 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 that is one point. Second point is that. Uh, when we uh, talk about sustainability, intergenerational equity, uh, we all know very well that we are not going to transfer income to our next generation. We will be transferring assets to the next generations. So it is critically important to keep track of the, the assets of all types, of course. Uh, but I will speak more from the natural asset side or natural capital side. So these are the two points we have to keep in mind. Uh, and finally, uh, the, I'm going to focus on the wealth, that wealth assessment, wealth monetization, as Jeffrey Hill was talking about um, how human capital is so important in, uh, uh, in, in larger you know, corporations like Apple or even Sony and others. Uh, um, they might not have much of produced capital, but their human capital through intellectual property rights, copyrights, leveling, um, uh, uh, they become very, very important. But that is part of human capital. Let me talk about natural capital. Now, uh, what is the context? Let me bring some context here. The Secretary General of the United Nations uh, under our common agenda has specifically mentioned the limitations of the GDP and the need to move beyond GDP. And that's why the chief executive board of the UN and the high level committee on programs, HLCP we call it, they have a core team to consider uh, how we move beyond GDP. And that also means how we measure natural capital, biodiversity lost, and degradation of ecosystems, and consequently, services flow from ecosystems. But uh, Jeffrey Hill was in that committee, which uh, uh, Joseph Stiglitz headed for uh, um, French government. And they have, they have been very vocal that GDP is not a good measure of progress. Uh, then last year, for the UK HM Treasury, uh, Sir Parthadas Gupta in Cambridge headed an independent review for the central bank. And they also suggested that uh, there is a need to move beyond GDP if we really want to make financial institutions sustainable in their lending, borrowing, saving, even managing sovereign wealth funds. I think uh, Partha's committee that is called Das Gupta Review is very, very vocal to, uh, on the issues that we must measure the wealth of the nations, not only income alone. And when we say wealth, uh, we call it inclusive wealth, that includes produced capital, natural capital, and human capital. So that is the context. And well, not only these reports and these documents, every day we are seeing that there is some announcement by the national government. For example, last 22nd of April, the White House announced that they will do natural asset or natural capital accounting. Uh, G20, which is going to meet in Indonesia, and Indonesia is the host, they are going to consider 
this is very seriously that how the development design and the practice should be uh, also based on the capitals or the wealth, including natural capital and not only GDP flow. So what is the, what is the wealth showing up? UNEP in its flagship uh, work on inclusive wealth of the nations uh, have estimated uh, for 163 countries, 163 countries, uh, their wealth that is produced capital, human capital, and natural capital. Uh, produced capital is all conventional capital. We also call it manufactured capital, uh, machine building, equipments, computer, you know, all those things. Uh, then you have human capital. In this, we have taken health and education, but I'm sure there can be much more which can be added. Third, in natural capital. And what we may we do not go for the market, market price or, mar or the transaction price or exchange price, because as Mathis has highlighted very clearly, market has limitations in uh, expressing the social worth of the resources, including natural resources. And for that reason, we need to do accounting price, or sometimes people call it shadow price of, of the resource. And in the context of project management, those of you who do, do project management, you would know that people have been using this. So you can use the accounting price or the shadow price for each resource, add them up, and that will tell you and in which direction we are moving. Also, we divide by the population so that you can see the change in uh, change in per capita wealth or inclusive wealth for the nations. And you can see from this diagram that since 1992, we have data for 2019 latest. Uh, you have inclusive wealth per capita, you have GDP per capita, that also we do. Uh, the orange color is your inclusive wealth per capita, and the red color is GDP per capita. One thing is interesting that uh, wealth, the rate of growth of wealth per capita is lower than GDP per capita growth, point number one. Second, produced capital per capita is much, much higher than any other kind of capitals, including human capital per capita. Now, that is fine. I mean, what is disturbing here that the natural capital per capita is almost on decline. And please remember, the, this natural capital has two components, uh, renewable and non-renewable both and they are showing again for 163 countries world bank data and it is showing a decline so that is disturbing second part is equally disturbing which is central bank of chile and other institutions like uh, a central bank of chile should be concerned about and that is that gdp per capita rate and the growth of gdp per capita is higher than growth rate in inclusive wealth per capita. Why it is disturbing? Because we are blurring the line of income and wealth. The great Simon Kuznets had warned us long back that income should not be mixed with wealth. The moment we do, we are heading towards very bad economics especially for sustainability. Of course, Simon Kuznets or Jens Mead or Ruggles couple in US, they never mentioned about sustainability in that sense, in the sense that we, we, we all use, but their intention was clear. They were smart people saying that skip separate wealth and income. But here, the moment we use GDP as a progress measure, we are on a very sticky wicket, to say the least. So, uh, our previous report also shows that 
uh, you know, some of the uh, top inclusive wealth per capita countries are not essentially the richest nations of the world. It, you, can, you can think about the analogy like per capita human development index uh, or, or per head, I mean, human development index. Some countries are doing very well who are doing better on social indicators. So GDP based indicators, even for the bank, may not be very reliable. Also, uh, going by um, this diagram, I don't know how clear it is on your screen. Uh, you have inclusive wealth per capita on the x-axis to the positive side, and you have uh, the GDP per capita here. You can see that many countries are falling in the quadrant, which are disturbing. They have high GDP per capita, but they have negative inclusive wealth per capita. It means these are the countries who are eating away the stock of wealth, and they are treating them as income or the sign of progress. And that's why it is unreliable if we measure your operation or ratio analysis based on the GDP. Now, what inclusive wealth uh, does and in, uh, uh, in, uh, in UNEP's uh, program of work, um, which is relevant to this audience and to the bank as well, that inclusive wealth index or wealth index tracks the impact of triple planetary crisis, climate change, pollution, and biodiversity loss very, very well, at least better than any other um, indicator. It also makes restoration justifiable on the basis of efficiency credit. Mind it, we are in the EU indicates of restoration until 2030. And if we include natural capital economy into economic Framing, I think uh, 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 we have we we have better chance to succeed on sustainability criteria. Uh, uh, of course, a planetary and human health nexus can be better understood uh, 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 through inclusive health because it recognizes human capital explicitly. Uh, with capital in focus, uh, not the flow, but the but the stock of capital, it is easier to implement circular or green economy objectives. And finally, since there are trade-offs across capitals in implementing sustainable consumption and production, uh, it is better to keep track of the wealth of the nations. The way business firms keep the balance sheet nations should also keep the balance sheet for, the, for themselves. And that will be tracking the wealth of the nations or inclusive wealth of the nations. Now, so what is the message coming out of this? The message is that we have to keep track of the wealth as a supplement to GDP, if you wish, and the lending and the borrowing uh, rate and other Monitor the, the tools and apparatus of monetary policies and also fiscal policy, wherever it is relevant, should recognize the change in the wealth of the nations or the county or the states, whatever relevant uh, uh, term or administrative unit is. And countries and their national statistical offices must measure basic stock of assets through their national accounts, and that must include natural capital. Uh, building national capacity to, to report on the wealth accounting is critical to reporting and knowing your wealth. So we must know our wealth. The bank would, and I'm so happy that IMF is so receptive to this idea, and so are the other treasury, and so, uh, uh, hats off to Central Bank of Chile, who could think of organizing this. So we must recognize how natural capital, human capital, and produced capitals are changing. But then it would require uh, 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 the capacity, um, and it would require a community of practitioners who can do it in their respective country. Uh, 
Of course, we need to grow our wealth, why not? But growth in the nation's wealth with the objective of maximizing social well-being in the long term. So if we maximize wealth, we the theory is clear and you know many authors and experts including Jeffrey Hill and Canaro, Gupta, we have the name in I mean many of them are noble novels by the way. They have proved that maximizing nation's wealth is a close proxy to maximizing social well-being in the long run. And social well-being increases over time if inclusive wealth increases over time. And it declines over time if inclusive wealth is reduced. So that theory is there. Also, policymakers interested in well-being and sustainability should not focus on income alone. Again, this is the point I'm trying to drive again and again. They should use inclusive wealth or comprehensive wealth or wealth as a key measure of economic you know, you know, achievement and accomplishment. Of course, for that, we have to invest in your wealth or our wealth. Reinvesting natural assets can help to grow overall wealth. And that is where the issues of restoration, what, uh, you know, uh, uh, Executive Secretary of CBD was emphasizing restoration. And uh, Das Gupta Review for UK's Treasury has also uh, mentioned, so has Matthias very clearly, very articulately saying that we, I mean, uh, uh, we are exceeding the demands on the uh, ecosystem services and natural capital is far exceeding the supply. And that's why we need to invest in a restoration. I, 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 and and uh, uh, this restoration, once we, we, we prove that this restoration improves natural capital, it will be easy to invite uh, all kind of investors, including private sector, and what we talk about blended finance concept will be really feasible in this sector as well. But then we must know the status of natural capital. Second, how to best convert natural assets into human and produced capital? This is a very critical part. I mean, uh, can produced capital and other kind of capital substitute for natural capital? We must know. In some cases, probably yes. In, in some cases, probably not. But a lot of empirical data needs to be generated. Without that, we are in dark. And we will be speaking in, in a popular language, which might not gain the point with the serious bankers and investors. So we, we, we need to know uh, whether uh, natural capital assets transformation into other kinds of capital uh, is really good or not, and to the extent, to what extent it is feasible. Uh, like, you know, the review, the Skupta review for UK has mentioned that in the last in the last 15 years, uh, we have increased, um, uh, you know, uh, the GDP by, I think, five times because 15 times the income has increased global, of course, and population has gone up by by three times. So it is basically five times per capita. But most of the wealth amassing has happened at the cost of natural capital. And that is what you have seen in the graph as well. Natural capital is on decline. Now, uh, trade-offs are inevitable in some cases, uh, but uh, I think uh, 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 we must know where they are. And that cannot be done until we do wealth accounting. Now, finally, where are the strategic interventions for the central bank of Chile or other agencies or NGOs like the WF, we must engage with the financial institutions. And that's why I'm very, very pleased that Central Bank of Chile has organized this. The treasuries and the development sectors, they have to recognize the role of natural capital into their operations. We must pile up beyond GDP, that is the wealth estimates, in selected countries and region, ideally everywhere, but at least 
a beginning must be made. It has been made. There are several countries who are doing it. They have done it. But we need more and more cases. And that will provide us, give us new insights and new information. And we can improvise upon it. And finally, we have to develop a community of practitioners. Otherwise, uh, uh, when we go to the field, we see the capacity is very, very basic. So a lot of focus has on an energy investment has to go on community of practitioners development uh, 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 and also the development uh, of the methodologies. I mean, even if we agree that we need to do wealth accounts, but then everybody will have a method in their pocket uh, that will, will confuse the public and that will bring all kind of hedginess and, and hurdles to the acceptability of even if the concept is very nice, we will have problems. So I think these three things uh, we have to keep in mind. I'm aware that I have not gone into the details that how, what are the components, how to calculate the shadow price of each of the resource that is in the, in the report of UNEP. And by the way, I would like to mention here that the next report of uh, uh, inclusive wealth of the nations is expected by the fall. And we are focusing that how having natural capital estimates and the wealth of the nation's estimates in place, it brings additional insights on economic inequality if inequality is measured through the wealth ratio, not only Gini coefficient and all. So watch out for this space and I'm happy to talk to you anytime on this. With that, uh, once again, thanks to the organizer uh, 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 for, for having me. And uh, I'm looking forward to having more interactions and your questions on this issue. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Pushpam, uh, for your very insightful uh, presentation. And uh, we indeed look forward to your uh, incoming report. Uh, so now uh, we move, and thank you for uh, sticking to the, the, the time. I think that's very, very useful as well. Uh, so now we move to the second presentation by uh, Gretchen Daly. Uh, Gretchen, please, the floor is yours. Fantastic. I will, um, first of all, thank you very, very much for um, all that you're organizing. It's extremely inspiring and um, uh, the beautiful introduction given by people earlier this morning and now by Pushpam in this session uh, just sets the stage perfectly for diving into ways of implementing these approaches like um, beyond GDP and the inclusive wealth accounting. Um, so let me just dive in. I'll try to share my screen quickly. So should be in process for you. Let's see, how does that look? Yeah, it looks perfect. Okay, fantastic. Well, um, let's just dive in. What I'd like to do is build on what Pushpam just laid out and um, present a little bit of the experience that I'm familiar with in um, advancing these approaches in countries, in real projects for achieving, you know, specific goals and outcomes. And all of this obviously is oriented around, like Pushpam was emphasizing, managing the natural capitalist stocks um, for prosperity for the future. And what it often comes down to um, partly is just this shift in thinking, moving away from the idea that GDP alone is the metric we need to follow and integrating nature into our thinking as an engine of prosperity. And then specifically in um, whatever regions in the world we live in, comes down to answering at some level questions like this, you know, where and how much should we protect? Um, how can we secure both people and nature in opening more inclusive um, and green pathways to development? And third, how can we move beyond GDP? What are the practical options now and how can we drive further innovation? So we've mentioned a number of the fantastic um, 
leaders who've helped advance a knowledge foundation going back um, to the 90s now, actually. And building upon that then, just looking at the history, and then I'll get right into what's happening today. Um, we found some very inspiring, pioneering cases. New York City, highlighted by Jeff Heal, actually, in early work. Costa Rica, China, all making major investments in nature, in natural capital, to secure, in New York's case, water quality for the city. In Costa Rica's case, to help restore forests. The country had the highest deforestation rate in the world. And um, multiple benefits were expected from um, hydropower production efficiency to um, boosting and sus sustaining ecotourism to a number of other things relating to water quality for drinking and um, also participating in the early stages of the carbon market. And then in China, um, this, this move involved um, paying 120 million farmers to secure forest and other sort of perennial um, plants across landscapes, especially in the steepy, steeply sloped, sorry, it's early here, the steeply sloped um, regions of the Yangtze River Basin. And um, this was just a transformative program. And so were all of them and all have now you know, continued. They're all being replicated and adapted in many countries around the world. From there, um, there was a real push to systematize more of a universal approach. And I'll just mention one path in this effort that taken by the Natural Capital Project this is a partnership of about now 100 research institutions and about 300 implementing institutions around the world. And the main aim is to build on all of the um, really strong foundation that has emerged that Pushpam um, described in his presentation and indicate um, and discover you know, how through ever more powerful demonstrations, we can bring these concepts and all of the um, data and uh, theory behind them into practice, um, such as in the cases I just mentioned. And then um, how we can support that with this natural capital platform, um, a set of data layers spanning the whole world, all countries, and a lot of experience that can accelerate um, the uptake of these approaches by um, countries, by cities, by sectors around the world based on experience that we have, based on data, and based on a lot of software tools that help make the theory and the science behind it accessible and actionable. And what we're seeing today, just to scroll ahead quickly is among the powerful partners, more and more are the development banks um, and the UN playing a really central role there in the middle. And um, with it, the Global Environment Facility, these aren't in a cosmic order, but, um, and then the private sector over on the side, I'm going to leave that kind of to the side, but the next frontier really is to bring the private sector into these approaches, setting standards, and committing with much more ambition to participating in the transformation that we need to seek um, in all countries. So I'll just show some examples now. All of them involve a blend of engaged science developed um, together with and for the users of the science, the advances in technology that support all of this that actually are pretty breathtaking 10 years ago we couldn't have done most of what is being done today. And there's great progress being made this minute. Transforming decisions um, in, in central banks, in uh, ministerial offices, in uh, mayor and city planning offices to achieve stewardship and well being, reward the stewardship and achieve improvements in well being. So, the approach that the Natural Capital Project 
has advanced involves integrating all of the data and science that we have for the many realms, let's say sectors of security that we need to achieve, whether it's climate security, water security, flood security, you know, health security, food production and security and so on. Um, this slide is meant just to capture the many different arenas in which we've now integrated the science to enable valuation of the ecosystem services that flow from natural capital stocks and the trade-offs that Pushpam alluded to that um, you never really get it all. You have to make strategic choices. And this approach is a way to inform those choices to evaluate what would happen under different scenarios. So it's being used in most countries and we've just recently with the advances in data quality at very, very fine scales um, developed and released a first few models for use in cities at, at those very fine scales. So all of the approaches involve this production function type analysis at the core, um, core to economics. So um, alternative, let's say we're considering a change, alternatives in management or policy, such as a shift to green agriculture. We would expect that to drive shifts in ecosystem structure and with it, for example, um, greater streamside habitat, and we could get quite specific about the area and location of that, changing ecosystem function, which would imply, among many other things, improved water filtration and retention, changing the benefits to people, the service itself, such as improving, reducing the amount of sediment in a stream and improving yields, lowering treatment costs and leading to other benefits to people. So that's just kind of the basic structure of all of the analysis that goes on um, in the software and in using these approaches. An example, very recently is um, in Europe, there was an assessment done once we released the urban invest models to evaluate basically the cooling capacity of land in cities across the continent. Um, looking at this heat mitigation index currently shown here um, under a green scenario for the future shown up here as compared to a more business as usual gray scenario that would involve much higher temperatures in cities and threats to well-being resulting from that. So um, I'll show you some examples, but I just want to emphasize how much this really is a co-development process. So there's an enormous spirit for working together and for decision makers. Um, and as examples, we've worked very closely in Costa Rica, also in China, for example, a delegation led here by um, the equivalent of kind of the Ministry of Finance and the Department of Development Planning, which um, orchestrates most decisions and policies across sectors in China. So I'll give a couple of examples from Latin America and the Caribbean and from China and how this has actually been implemented. Uh, the first concerns water security for cities, a case uh, going back to the New York case and one that um, Jeff Heal really popularized going back to the 90s, where um, as we know worldwide in Chile as well, water security is becoming a ever more important issue for downstream consumers. The source of water often is far away in kind of a world apart culturally and in other terms. And um, the idea is to develop approaches like in New York that involve agreements from downstream consumers to upstream suppliers and investments made in upstream communities of land stewards to promote shifts in practice that can change and improve natural capital and thereby improve the um, quality, quantity, and timing of flow of water to support all the different downstream uses. And this using the invest software involves in upstream watersheds, 
identifying what portfolio of investments in, let's say, forest protection, reforestation, adding trees to pasture and silvopasture, things like fencing and enrichment of understory vegetation, especially near places where um, cows and other livestock are concentrated to support water quality for cities. And here, um, this is in Colombia. I think I, yeah, I missed a slide showing where this is in the Cauca Valley of Colombia, um, but leading to improved water quality as a function of the budget, this one of many analyses, analyses one can conduct to decide where and how much to invest in these regions to support uh, downstream benefits. This approach is now being advanced across Latin America and is quite well known thanks to the Nature Conservancy and especially the Inter-American Development Bank that has been supporting it. It's also being adopted um, across Asia and in Africa. And here, um, Luis Alberto Moreno from IDB a few years ago, um, committing to scaling this approach across Latin America. I'll give another example very briefly from the Caribbean, where we have um, increasingly intensive and damaging hurricanes hitting the region, and a question of how to secure the region given how global the causes are from climate shifts driven by mostly other countries, barely at all by the Caribbean. And, um, but one of the local approaches that can be taken is investing in coastal zone planning to identify places, especially the natural capital embodied in coral reefs, in mangroves, in seagrass beds that can help secure people and property from these ever more intensive storms and also at least in the near term from sea level rise, buying time to adapt to climate change. So working in Belize and also in other parts, um, the Bahamas, countries where we had access to um, high level decision makers, the Coastal Zone Management Authority in Belize, we developed plans using this approach. I'm not showing all the um, kind of analytics that were developed, but across the uh, different coastal zones in Belize and spanning every sector from offshore energy production, it's still oil and gas, offshore shipping, nearshore and offshore fishing, um, tourism with cruise ships and also a lot of recreational activities nearshore, and then onshore infrastructure investment and development, a new port, um, other transportation energy uh, systems, communication systems, and then agriculture and um, forest inland. So integrating over all of that, we developed um, a coastal zone management plan that was approved by the government in 2016 and financed by the Inter-American Development Bank. Um, it's been renewed in 2021. It's a 20 year plan and advanced and has been considered very successful so that now IDB is scaling this approach across all of its you know, member countries. Now, finally, I want to go to China, which is a much longer story than we have time for, but touches on a key point of push bombs, namely um, how to drive this into practice and especially how to move beyond GDP. So China began with the beginnings in all places, uh, needing an ecosystem assessment, then moved to land zoning and livelihood security, basically rural vitalization to enable many of the investments that are crucial for securing not only rural regions, but all the urban people dependent on them. And then finally, advancing a new metric and approach called gross ecosystem product. So super briefly, the ecosystem assessment just involved gathering all the data that I mentioned are now in that natural capital platform. But here, often in countries, one can get 
excuse me, more refined local data um, to support analysis of the provision of this suite of high priority benefits here, including biodiversity conservation, part of the natural capital stock. And what they found in work that we did together um, was that over the past, the 10 year period analyzed from 2000 to 2010, investments made through that original sloping land conversion program led to great improvements of natural capital stocks and service flows in all areas except for biodiversity. Um, but it was a signal that the policies were working and the country committed to much greater biodiversity conservation investments subsequent to this analysis. They also continue this assessment every five years. And it drives um, then decisions around land zoning and other policies across the country. So China has now zoned about 50% of its land area as priority areas for driving these investments to achieve these national priority outcomes listed here, and also to achieve many more local outcomes that are driven um, through bottom-up policy approaches. So they're both top-down and bottom-up policy approaches that are um, supported and brought to life thanks to investments in these regions where today over 200 million people are being paid to restore natural capital. And um, all of this is being well analyzed and supported um, by social science um, approaches, um, natural science and engineering approaches, and a lot of economics throughout. And finally with GEP, I'll just close to say, um, Briefly, the country wanted to move beyond GDP for a long time, um, but there was no greening of GDP really coming. And so eventually they started um, advancing an idea of gross ecosystem of pro product, which is constructed very parallel to GDP in um, basically being all the goods and services, although this is an initial lower bound um, sort of classification of goods and services for which we have the science and data to calculate an actual um, production. Um, but these are shown to the right, all the goods and services coming from ecosystems multiplied by some um, sensible measure of value, economic value. And I have mental health in parentheses. That's one that's next on the horizon in terms of um, the science innovation. So basically this accounting framework, it is based very much in the UN SIA system and it involves revealing you know, where, how much and to whom uh, benefits are generated and flow. And it's calculated bringing in a wide range of data sources um, and then using the invest models to estimate service flows and then reporting three things. One, the contribution of ecosystems to the economy and society. Two, um, guiding, you know, reporting what's needed to guide financial compensation among regions. And right now this is all within China, but one could imagine um, supporting international cross country investments. And then third, to evaluate performance of policies and the leaders made meant to um, drive them into investment. So this being part of the UN SIA system was approved in March, 2021. And since then there's been a lot of interest by many countries to adopt GEP and just play around with it and try to get going, advancing um, capacity within country and advancing particular projects that could lead to near-term um, successes upon which countries could build to drive an ever more comprehensive approach. 
So this is being supported by the MDBs and also the Global Environment Facility. And we're in Colombia, for example, working first in the Golfo de Morosquillo, an area prioritized by the Department of National Planning um, to to find where to invest to achieve the development objectives of that region, where to invest in natural capital and how to track progress and integrate that into this accounting framework. And now um, working very hard to develop a national methodology for natural capital accounting, all consistent with the UN approaches that Pushpam um, described. And third then to inform this uh, national development plan for the next president. That's what we're up to now. And um, we're trying to support the MDBs in their pledge made at the COP26 to mainstream nature throughout their operations by 2025. And the big challenge, frankly, is how to do this quickly enough. So I'll just close saying um, there's huge commitment now. And the question really is how to make the advances as rapidly and compellingly as possible with a primary aim of building capacity within countries, especially central banks and other key um, parts of government needed to develop these aspirations, make them concrete in plans and start um, driving investments that are measurable leading to outcomes aligned with um, development priorities. So it's a key moment and I'm very grateful to everyone involved in all of this and especially to the Central Bank of Chile for opening this conversation further to capitalize on the momentum, to innovate together and achieve regeneration at scale in the very near term here. Thank you so much. I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thank you, Gretchen, uh, for a very fascinating and, and, and moving presentation. Um, uh, it's very nice to see how this is uh, becoming actionable in many places in the world. And uh, maybe we can, at some point, be next. <laughs> it will be very interesting to follow up on that. So uh, to close our session this morning, we have uh, Pablo Marquette. Uh, Pablo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pablo. Um, a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation um, to share with you. And uh, what I want to do today is actually um, take a step uh, back and try to see the big picture of the dynamics that uh, Yuma has followed in order to um, reach the point where we are, uh, the human predicament uh, that we faced. And um, in order to do that, I'm gonna exemplify with some very simple systems. And actually um, the, the message I want to convey is that there is something in that dynamics that not only um, allow us to understand where we are and why we are where we are, but also um, the, the, we can um, reorient uh, that dynamic. We have to try to, to transform that dynamics, and um, in order to uh, to get out of the of the problems that we face. So um, let me share my screen. Uh, here. Hope you are seeing my screen. Um, hope you are seeing my screen. Is that right? Yep, we see it. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you. Well, um, I want to convey a couple of messages uh, in, with my presentation. One that uh, is that biodiversity um, and human as as well as part of it, uh, are governed by the same dynamics, which uh, I will emphasize two of the main components, which is niche contraction and uh, through social learning. And that there are limits to these dynamics, which we call planetary boundaries, and that they can, they can be measured. 
I'm going to give you some examples. And that uh, in order to play within uh, those boundaries, it requires uh, technological, economic, social, and philosophical transformation to reorient human niche construction through social learning. And this is very important because uh, we have to uh, repair, uh, so to speak, the, the clash between social scientists and, and natural scientists. Um, we have to bring more social science, we have to bring more philosophy into this problem and educators too, because the transformation we require, uh, it has to be based on social learning, which needs to, to actually uh, align the top-down and bottom-up solution. Bottom-up means they have to be uh, enshrined in people interactions and, um, and, and this has to be aligned with uh, whatever countries uh, UN and other governance uh, at the high level can do. And I'm gonna end up with the big issue, which is how to grow, um, construct a more equal society and do so within ecological boundaries. And this is the, the problem with uh, developing countries and poor countries and, and in the South especially, uh, is that most of the time these boundaries are already exceeded. So uh, how are we going to get out of this difficult situation? Um, that's a thing is, is an open question that we should uh, reflect on. So let me start with a very simple system. So I'm gonna try to explain part of this uh, dynamics of biodiversity uh, using a bacterial uh, culture. Um, and uh, I'm gonna just talk about Escherichia coli, uh, E. coli in a finite planet. So we're going to put, uh, this actually was an experiment done a while ago, is to put uh, an isogenic, so most, mostly uh, equal individuals of E. coli in a, a flask and just leave it there. You know, you don't put any nutrients, nothing else, but you just leave it there and you look what happened to this. So uh, what happened is that the culture here is start growing after a while of actually sensing the environment start growing exponentially and until it reach a limit. It reach a boundary where the resources are exhausted. And eventually what you predict is that after this exhaustion, of resources in the environment, uh, the, the bacterial culture will die. But it doesn't do that, actually. Uh, what happened is that it keeps going for a long time. Uh, remember that this is a, a long-term food deprivation for E. coli, um, and it keeps going for hours, days, months. Eventually, it reached up to 60 months, uh, which is five years of, uh, of just keep going in within the flask. And, we have been trying to understand these dynamics. And uh, one of the things that happened in this flask is that E. coli transformed the environment. When it changed the environment, it transformed itself and give rise to a different variant of the original um, strain. And this variant transformed the environment again and gives and it modifies it, uh, the, 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 the variant that did that and uh, changes again and again and again until it reached to a, 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 a point of coexistence of different, uh, of a diverse ecosystem of uh, transformation. So this is niche construction in, in a simple way, uh, which is modification of environment that actually change the selective forces that are impacting on the organism that actually do the transformation, changing it and so on and so forth. In a, sort of uh, uh, co-evolutionary uh, dynamics. So this, is, uh, this is, uh, is, is, uh, can be um, analyzed. I'm just showing this because uh, when I retake this uh, later on, uh, you can do, a, we did a, li a little model of the phi here is the biomass of the bacteria in this uh, seal compartment that depends of, uh, have a, a growth rate that depends on the quality of the habitat, which is W, which, which actually depends on the supply of resources. Uh, and Lambda here is the flux of ecosystem services that go into the environment and make it available for the biomass to actually use it. <coughs> and there are some um, uh, consumption also that gives uh, rise to the dynamics of the quality of the habitat. Um, what we found with this model is that 
uh, what it drives the dynamic of the system is an increased efficiency and <clears throat> collaboration among the different strains in actually in transforming the environment. And, and, and that was the key of the success. Well, it happens that niche construction also has been one of the major drivers of, uh, behind the, the success of, of, of the human enterprise on our planet. And, um, and just let me give you a measure of this success uh, just by uh, showing you this very interesting uh, general pattern um, is called the Damuth law. <clears throat> if you take the density of different uh, species of mammals across the world and you graph them, uh, the density versus the size of the organism, you'll find that there is this very interesting relationship and very significant that the maximum density they can achieve uh, follow this rule. And um, this is uh, kind of well understood now uh, why it's, it's, it's that way. But this gives us the uh, baseline to measure what you would expect the density of a mama would be uh, given its size. If you plot here a human, a typical human being, um, let me, there you go. If we put humans in this, uh, in this uh, um, graph, you'll see that uh, this is the expected uh, density we, will, we should achieve. And this is the, the, uh, the highest or the highest uh, density, the, the maximum density we achieve. So there is a 58,000% more uh, on, and, uh, on density. So actually uh, we have now a pattern to explain what, how it comes that we can achieve such a uh, huge densities. And part of the, part of the, uh, uh, of this is, is reflected. Uh, uh, if you analyze this pattern of density and energy consumption per individual uh, through uh, human um, evolution from hunter gatherers to pre-industrial to border cities, you'll see here, the, here's the, in, in green, you have the mammal kind of a relationship. And uh, here you have hunter gatherers which are pretty well within the boundaries of what you would expect. Uh, but then in pre-industrial society moves towards a higher energy per capita consumption and higher uh, density. And then in modern cities, this is just uh, way above uh, the, the expected for uh, a, typical, a typical mammal. And so much so that actually uh, if now we graph here, the total, the total energy used by this populations of different organisms, uh, you will see that we are now in modern cities above the global average net primary productivity, um, meaning that uh, we are exceeding the uh, ability of the planet to regenerate uh, itself, as it was pointed out in the, in the first panel, and we are becoming sinks of energy consumption uh, on the planet. So, how it comes that we are so successful or measuring in, in terms of uh, a number of individuals, uh, how it comes that we are so um, dense on this planet? Well, part of the, of the, of the thing is, uh, is associated with social learning. Social learning is pretty much anything that you can, is this dynamic of teaching and learning that is produced in animal, uh, animal groups. And that actually leads to um, a, a particular kind of uh, uh, innovations that uh, can be taken uh, on or, or captured in this little graph here, where you have this kind of socio-ecological loops where you have at the center is population size. As you increase population size, you increase social learning activity. And this gives rise to technological innovation that affect the national capital and the flow of ecosystem services, services and, and all the, 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 the contributions that nature uh, makes people. And, but population size not only change technology, uh, it allows to, or is reflected also on, on changes in the settlement pattern from more um, nomadic to more sedentary ones and the, con and the concentration of people in a particular place, which actually uh, uh, have a positive effects on on social learning, and also uh, gives rise to ideological innovations, which means way of, of being in the world 
and conceptions about the world and reflected in economic system, system of values uh, and, and governance that affect also the uh, natural capital and the provision of ecosystem services. So um, this is pretty much the, uh, the, the dynamics, you know, that um, um, underlies um, pretty much the, the, the development of human society and the human phenomenon. And, and the thing is that can we capture and project this and see what may happen in the future? And uh, we did that, uh, but now we are gonna put Homo, Homo sapiens in this finite planet and do the same thing as we did with the bacteria. Uh, we can capture this in this simplified three equations model. You'll have growth rate, which again depends on the, on, on the quality of the environment. Phi is the human biomass on the planet. And now we have that this quality of the environment depends on two terms. One, that is this uh, positive on a mu, mu being um, the technological uh, dynamics which depends on the human biomass. So this term here, the third equation captures pretty much the, um, the social um, learning part of this dynamics and the accumulative uh, character of it because it accumulates through time. Um, and this one here in the second equation, this minus term captured the, uh, the externalities, whatever you capture and uh, use ecosystem uh, services, you can generate some uh, negative externalities. And if this relationship between these two uh, exponents um, um, is beyond some threshold, you, know, you get uh, you get different kind of equilibrium. So what we learn from this, uh, here is, the, for example, the relationship between uh, of the capture of ecosystem services to produce or of energy fluxes to produce uh, technological exportation of patents. And here are the associated uh, CO2 emissions. So you see that um, the, the play between this, the, 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 the scaling of these two benefits and cost is drives the dynamics. And you can uh, summarize this in this kind of complicated uh, scheme that I'm gonna try to make simple for you. This is theta. Theta is the, uh, the relationship between uh, the, the two exponents. And if it's positive, means that the technology being developed actually have a positive impact on the, on the environment and on the sustainability of the ecosystem services being produced. So uh, it has a positive sustainability impact. And um, if it's negative, it has uh, a negative impact on the delivery. And, um, and on this x-axis, you have the technological feedback in terms of how fast it actually gives rise, a technology gives rise to a new one. Um, so as you can see here, what I'm graphing in colors is the quality of the environment. So in order to have a high quality environment, you have to have a positive uh, sustainability in terms of uh, technology that produce um, and, um, um, uh, and generate ecosystem services fluxes, but uh, um, is being kind of a sustainably managed and you can uh, eventually uh, achieve a, a good environmental, and also you can uh, achieve high population density. Uh, on the other side, you can do the same, but um, achieve high population density. If you have a very bad technology, they have a, a really bad impact on the environment, but if it's very um, um, old and doesn't have any um, great impact in terms of producing uh, more of this bad technology. So, um, and in between uh, are zones where we have pretty much uh, extinction of human biomass. So this gives rise to this kind of dynamics here uh, where you have population growth, community cultural evolution, technological innovation, uh, affecting ecosystem, uh, ecosystem services delivery, and again, feedback uh, back to population and economic growth. And uh, the, the question is, can this dynamic keep going forever or there are limits to it? And eventually we know for, uh, for a long time since the, the famous, the Limit to Growth book um, that was a report to the Club of Rome uh, based on the project of the human predicament. And uh, this, this book marked um, um, a new way of looking at the problem. And 
and uh, it made clear that the trends by that time were of uh, an exponential increase in fertilizer consumptions, world production, and that there might be uh, limits to uh, the anticipated changes in arable land and, and agricultural activity uh, based on, on, on those, the, on those the, uh, trends. Um, what we now know uh, is pretty much the same. Uh, let me show you what was the model behind the projections they did. Uh, they did projections uh, based on this model, which is the world three computer model, very complicated one. And they make a, a scenario of modeling industrial capital and how that capital actually um, uh, was reflected also in uh, agricultural activities, services, and resource obtaining um, uh, endeavors and the output they, they produce. So they generated different kind of uh, scenarios where you have uh, resources, population, size, and also pollution of the negative externalities of those activities. And some of the, uh, of the scenarios were um, non-sustainable and eventually there was a decrease in human well-being and also in the ecological footprint. Uh, but there were some that were sustainable and uh, those were characterized by population and industrial output to be uh, limited by technologies that uh, added um, value and uh, help to abate pollution that conserve resources, increase land yield and protect agricultural land. And the resulting society was sustainable, nearly uh, achieving 8 billion people uh, living in, in high human welfare and uh, with a continually declining uh, ecological footprint. So uh, sustainability, sustainability was possible and under some circumstances. We now know that um, eventually the, um, um, the data has improved um, much more. And, and now we, we are uh, in, in, the, in, in this, we can understand much better both socioeconomic trends and air system trends um, under what has been called the, uh, the great acceleration, which is pretty much starting in the 50s and uh, where we see a, an, an uh, exponential increase in human population, energy use, fertilized consumption, and also uh, an increase in earth systems uh, components like uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, forest loss, and uh, marine capture, marine fish capture, etc. So um, this, can, this has been uh, recently or more recently associated what we call with planetary boundaries, uh, pretty much uh, a way of trying to identify what is the safe operating space for uh, human activities without endangering uh, the, the, the all of the same climate that we have. So, um, and integrity of the biosphere. So they identify nine, uh, nine uh, axes for this. And you see, we are uh, already exceeding several of this, including land, land use and, and biochemical flows. And this is a framework that can be can be used, it can be uh, uh, at some point it's, it's, it's difficult to measure many of this uh, dif different uh, axes, um, but at least they provide uh, a, a kind of a conceptual way of uh, analyzing or internalizing the existence of, of boundaries and the fact that we live in a finite planet. So we did this exercise for Chile and, and, and the scenario doesn't look very good. As you can see here, we are highly exceeded in, in chemical contamination. Uh, we analyze this for the agricultural industry, too much pesticides for the, the amount of land we cultivate, uh, too much phosphorus and nitrogen produced by the agricultural sector, but also aqu aquaculture. And uh, land use change has, it's, uh, it's, it's really, really exceeded 300%. And we are also exceeded in terms of uh, climate change um, and also in terms of biodiversity losses associated to the, the scale of the transformation, uh, as well as uh, we are also exceeded in atmospheric contamination. So uh, we have a problem and uh, eventually um, we have to, to radically transform the way we do business in Chile in order to in improve the situation. So um, with all this, we achieved to, we, we, we sort of um, have um, 
several alternatives. Um, and I know whether be pessimistic uh, or optimistic. The optimistic will be the uh, uh, Jeffrey Sachs claiming that we are in the age of sustainability, sustainable development, and all the development of the sustainable development goals, and that we can actually uh, achieve them in, in record time by transforming and and really kind of uh, trying to um, move the economy to um, to foster these goals. And on the other hand, we have, uh, for example, this this. Um, analysis we did back in 2012, where uh, we anticipate that by 2045, there might be a big nonlinear transition to a, a, a type of uh, ecological state of the biosphere that might not be sustainable. And to recover previous level will take a long time of um, new measures. So uh, what is lies in between how we do achieve this transformation? Uh, to some extent, uh, we have to um, take a different path. Uh, one of them, one of the possibilities I uh, would like to emphasize is the nature-based solution, which not only help to protect and manage sustainable and restore ecosystems, but also take care of the societal challenges associated to climate change, food and water security, and actually improve well-being. And also has uh, tangible biodiversity benefits, um, which is uh, very important to think holistically in in the problem. So uh, we have also, it is well known that uh, they, this, all this uh, nature-based solution, there is a, a portfolio of them for the forest area, agricultural wetlands, and they can provide uh, one third of the mitigation we need to uh, achieve the, uh, uh, the Paris goal. Um, this is it's worth emphasizing that there are uh, importance of mitigating the energy sector, but uh, nature-based solution can 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 foster uh, not only uh, achieve these goals, but also make them sustainably and change the way we uh, uh, do business. For Chile, it can account to uh, potentially of, of 53 teragrams of CO2, which pretty much is half uh, of the net uh, emissions of Chile. And um, so, and there is great opportunity in, in the forest sector and uh, agriculture, and also in the expansion of the uh, of the protected area system. So, um, finishing, uh, if we want to change uh, the, the 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 things um, that are um, affecting, or the or if we want to tackle the the human predicament, we have uh, several possibilities. One is is tackling this loop here. Uh, with population side technological innovation and, and generate positive technology that uh, actually maintain a steady flow of ecosystem services without without uh, um, affecting negatively the natural capital. Or we uh, also we can uh, take up on this loop here and and change the way we do business in terms of our economics and the way we think uh, uh, our place within the system is the way we inhabit this environment. And here is where we have to bring the social sciences uh, together uh, with the natural sciences to actually push for a, a new way of being in the world. And uh, especially this is an economic problem and uh, finishing the problem is how we uh, actually uh, um, align economic development with social equality and uh, also with uh, uh, growth that doesn't harm the environment, especially in, um, in, in countries which have already exceeded environmental uh, boundaries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Paolo. A very, very interesting uh, presentation. Um, now, uh, we, we have a, a lot of questions, actually. <laughs> so I have to be uh, more selective. And uh, I thank the, the, the team for, for sending me a few of those in, in, the, in the direct chat. Uh, so I, will, I want to read them all uh, at the same time and then give uh, space for our speakers to, to tackle them. And uh, I would like to do it in reverse order. So starting with Pablo, then uh, Gretchen, and, and closing with, uh, uh, with Pushpa. So the first question is, uh, what role should public policy play to, uh, and to, to incentivize a, a more widespread adoption of the um, concepts of investing in natural capital 
on corporate practices. Uh, so that's one, one first question that, that, is, that, is, that is here. Uh, there's a second question uh, specifically to Gretchen uh, related to the Colombia project. And uh, the question is on uh, whether in, in any way the project has interacted with the difficult social and political circumstances related of rural, commo 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 uh, rural communities uh, affected by narco-terrorism. Uh, and then uh, I have uh, another uh, third question, and I think we can we can close it we, we can close it there. Uh, what uh, would be uh, the immediate and most important actions that central banks, financial supervisors, and other members could um, undertake to uh, use the available tools for biodiversity measurement? So I think these three questions cover a, a lot of ground. And uh, I'm very interested as well as the audience on, on hearing your take on them. So, uh, Pablo, if, if, you, if you can, you can start with, with this and we have about 10 minutes for, for all, of, or all of us. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. And um, very quickly, um, uh, I'm not an expert on, on, on most of this term of, of this topic, but um, I think a public policy is central. And, and let me just speak by the Chilean case, because... Um, uh, it's, it's very kind of a, a timing, timely. And one of the things that is interesting in Chile is that we have, since last year, the, the, a new ministry, which is the Ministry of Science, and uh, it has made make a, a huge difference to have uh, a ministry of, this, of science sitting with all the other ministries in the same table. Uh, and uh, that has brought the uh, the need to uh, generate public policy based on scientific understanding of uh, of this of the system we are working on and one of the things uh, that is, is essential is uh, actually is how we can measure uh, more uh, how can we monitor uh, and actually have a model for how the country could develop that we can use it to actually uh, inform uh, uh, changes and inform policies. So th this is now becoming very, very important in in in, in Chile. And um, uh, let me give you uh, also a, a, a quick answer to the third question, which is the the, the role of central banks in, in making uh, the transformation actionable. I think this is fundamental. It's fundamental, but uh, it's fundamental to also team up with other ministry and sectors in Chile. Uh, I think that the education, I don't know why, but the education ministry is always absent of all these conversations. And it's fundamental if we want, we, we just, we are not just in, in the adaptation mode. We have to go into the transformation mode and the transformation mode uh, actually requires that we form uh, and we teach the new generations. And, uh, um, and that's one of the, the, the things that I think is, have to be done is to recognize the, the multi-sectoral um, sectoral, uh, uh, nature of the problems that we face, especially climate change, and uh, uh, also bring uh, other ministries on, on top. And in, in clear actions, I will say, uh, we have dossiers for um, portfolios of natural-based solutions that can actually help us to transform the way we do business in, in, in Chile and uh, actually uh, th they can be uh, economically viable and they can generate profit uh, and, and growth. So uh, there are options. Uh, we just need to, 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 to be willing to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo. Thank you very much. Uh, Gretchen. Wonderful. Thank you. Those are really good questions and a great pass at them by Pablo and I'll just go a little bit further on the first one um, with respect to public policy and corporate practices there is this task force for nature related financial disclosure and other key efforts underway to um, move toward a world in which corporations are required to reveal asset locations you know, and activities so that it's possible to see what the impacts and dependencies of uh, corporate assets and activities are on nature, on natural capital, and to reveal the risks and costs um, embodied in the 
system we have operating today and identify the responsibility that should be taken by private sector actors in um, contributing to this transformation toward uh, regenerative approaches and uh, revealing where you know the opposite is going on um, and yeah just harmonizing I guess sorry I'm speaking quite what quite vaguely but we're I'll give an example we are working with a, um, a financial services company who is asking us to do all of this and we're developing the um, software analytics to reveal for the company so they can look internally this is not yet revealed publicly um, what the impacts and dependencies of all of their assets are and then yeah actually several we have partnerships with several entities working on this from different angles um, that eventually hopefully would reveal to lead to this being transparent second on colombia really good question relating to the difficult social and political circumstances there. And um, all of the work has actually been very sensitive in its design and development, whether in the context of water security for cities, those fondos del agua often involve prioritizing areas where um, there is a great need to um, advance livelihood security and alternative new livelihoods for places that have been really severely impacted by the civil war and engaging communities in the work to help promote more security financial you know financial and other kind of sort of reintegration into um, social systems today also in the context of tourism, there's a major investment planned and underway that will also target communities in rural regions and indigenous regions and other communities that are um, more vulnerable and key to achieving broader um, social development and security across the country. So thank you for that really key question. And then finally on um, central banks, I just and and other key actors within countries, how to start using the tools available for measuring natural capital. Um, I would just say that Jeff, we're the natural capital project is in the final stages of an agreement with the Global Environment Facility to um, open up training and demonstrations in five Latin American countries supported by Inter-American Development Bank. We're hoping very much that Chile will be one of those five. And this also, this all happened in the last couple of days. We also hosted Ban Ki-moon here, who was Secretary General of the UN for many years, as everybody knows. He's launching dialogues through his foundation that will focus on achieving the sustainable development goals through natural capital types of approaches. And um, we aim through these dialogues also to provide training and a kind of an arena for South-South collaboration in advancing um, all of the kind of initial steps of projects and capacity building and, um, and then more ambitious, you know, adoption and innovation within country and teaching across the world what what works. Thank you so much again. Thank you, Gretchen, for your for your comments. Um, Ushpan, closing words. Uh, thanks. Not a closing word, but just to just to emphasize uh, that what private sector can do and what are the issues for the private sector. Uh, that is the question which you highlighted, one of the uh, participants asked. Uh, uh, we have to, I mean, uh, national government, of course, for the national balance sheet, they would try to uh, assess, quantify, monetize natural capital besides other types of capital. But the private sector, which 
constitute a big chunk of transaction in the global and national economy, uh, they have to ask uh, that wh what is at stake for them. Uh, uh, I won't go to private sector with the persuasion that, oh, this is under corporate social responsibility or some charity. No. We, they have to understand, and many of them already understand it probably better than other stakeholders, that their triple uh, bottom line is dependent upon natural capital. Their supply chain is dependent upon natural capital. Their long run business interest sustainability is thriving on the prosperity of people and planet as emphasized in SDG 17 goals, 169 targets, and as of now, around 250 indicators. So, the prosperity of people and planet are not uh, separate, they are interlinked. They are also interlinked whether you are in North or in South. So once these points become clear, uh, and this can be made clearer, very explicit and compelling, if we have a national balance sheet of natural capital, then, Private sectors, as uh, Grishan has already mentioned, there are many motivated private sectors, they understand it, but many, many more as a tsunami, they will join the, this. They will start doing uh, extended cost benefit analysis. They are doing life cycle assessment. They will see that to, in order to have a healthy planet, healthy people, equitable and sustainable, they have to recognize the role of natural capital. It might take some time. For some firms who are of different sizes, one has to study that. It could be some trade-off. There could be some trade-off in the short run or in the medium run. But eventually, everybody will face the win-win situation because everything depends upon nature. One of the figures, again, which I have never seen quoted so widely, um, is the contribution of nature to global GDP. I mean, that citation tells us that people in general are willing to embrace the role of nature in their life and economy. So once we start, as you have done, uh, the Central Bank of Chile, it, it will really come to the private sectors and they will accept it. Uh, one more thing. I think uh, in lending, in borrowing, in monetary policy, in fiscal policy, I think there should be a proper integration of natural capital. And this cannot be done unless we have a, a, a credible estimate and valuation of natural capital. And all the work which the clinics are doing, especially natural capital work and others, and even system will will pave the path in that direction thanks thank you very much Upnam, for those for those interesting closing closing words on your side uh we are coming to the end of the session only two minutes ahead of a schedule which is a success given chilean standards so i congratulate everybody i want to thank uh, pablo gretchen and, and pushman for their very insightful uh, 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 presentations and also for the remarks they did at the end. Uh, now we end this session and I, um, call, I invite everybody to uh, continue online because in a few minutes we will have the third session of the conference with a very interesting panel of discussion. Thanks uh, for everybody and uh, we'll continue to, to see you here. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. All the panelists for amazing contributions. We have a short break of eight, eight minutes now. So please come back at uh, 1220 to continue with our third session. Thank you so much.
uh, to our last session of the day, to session three. Um, so let me now to pass the floor to Mr. John Tobin, a professor of practice uh, of corporate uh, sustainability at the Dyson School of Applied Economics and Management from Cornell University. Uh, John, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you and uh, welcome all. Thank you very much for joining us for this roundtable discussion of the topics of today. My name is John Tobin de la Puente and I am an ecologist and lawyer by training, but have spent most of my career working in the financial services industry and uh, am now on the faculty of Cornell University in New York State in the United States, where I work on matters at the intersection of biodiversity and finance. Uh, in this session, we're going to revisit some of the topics that have been addressed during today's earlier sessions. And, and in particular, first on biodiversity and ecosystem services, and secondly, on the measurement of biodiversity and natural capital and the negative effects of at least some of our economic activity on nature. The format of the roundtable will be very simple. We will be posing just two questions to the panelists, and we will ask each of the panelists to respond to the first question. And after going through the various responses, we will be posing then the second question and asking them again to provide their responses. Uh, the panelists know this, but uh, it's always good to remind them uh, each response should be no longer than about uh, four minutes long. And I apologize in advance to the panelists if I do have to jump in if we're taking uh, too long on one response or another, but because we do want to fit in all of the responses. Uh, please note that uh, uh, unlike the earlier panel sessions, uh, we will not be using slides during this roundtable. So from the point of view of the audience, uh, I'd expect that we'll be seeing responses that are perhaps a bit more personal, uh, perhaps a bit more editorial than some of the uh, earlier responses. Uh, and if we have some time at the end, we'll be taking some of your questions. So please be sure to include them in the Q&A, but we'll have to see how, uh, how we're doing for time uh, before we make that choice. Anyway, we have an excellent lineup for the session uh, with individuals who can knowledgeably speak about the macroeconomic effects of habitat degradation and the implications of biodiversity loss on financial stability. Unfortunately, uh, Ms. Maisa Rojas, the Minister of the Environment of Chile, whom you heard of uh, or heard from at the start of today's session, uh, has had an unexpected scheduling issue. So she will not be able to uh, join this roundtable. But in her place, uh, we'll be hearing from uh, Professor Rodrigo Arraigada who is the head of the Information and Environmental Economics Division of the Ministry of the Environment of Chile and an associate professor at the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile. We will also hear from Marcelo Mena, the director of the Climate Action Center at the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Valparaíso, not too far from Santiago. Uh, after that, we will have uh, Cristina Dorador, a member of the uh, National Constituent Assembly uh, of Chile and Associate Professor of Biotechnology at the Universidad de Antofagasta. Following that, we will have Rafaelo Servigni, the uh, lead environmental economist at the World Bank. And finally, we'll hear from Catherine Willis, who is a uh, principal of St. Edmund Hall and also Professor of Biodiversity at the University of Oxford. Again, uh, uh, very specific questions and uh, 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 let me pose the first one for you and ask uh, that uh, uh, we get started with uh, uh, Professor Regada. Uh, short responses, uh, but uh, punchy and, and to the point. And uh, uh, let's start with one, what are the expected impacts imposed by 
biodiversity loss and ecosystem degradation that you identify as the major threats for the future? Okay, uh, well, thank everybody for, for, for the opportunity to uh, share some, some thoughts about this. Well, uh, biodiversity sustains several processes such as pollination, erosion control, food production, climate regulation that are, are, are very well recognized in the scientific community. In fact, numerous experiments show that ecosystem function depend on the number of species that can be found in, in, a, in a specific place. So ecosystem with less biodiversity, uh, for example, of pollinators uh, have less range of tolerance to temperature changes. In the same, in the same way, we have fewer species facing an environmental change. These functions are more easily affected. I would like to, to make a, 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 an analogy uh, between the number of species and, and the pieces of an airplane. Every time that we lose biodiversity, we're losing a piece of our airplane. So some parts may seem redundant. If we lose them momentarily, the plane continues to fly. However, in turbulence, this may be the key part that support the aircraft, thus making us resilient to turbulences. To the fact that, that if we lose more and more parts and we are taking about an airplane that is even less safe to fly, so eventually this plane will lose so many parts that it will not be able to, 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 to be a safe aircraft to fly. So, so this is probably a, a, a clear and a, a very simple way to understand how biodiversity is key for the provision of, of ecosystem services and, 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 and underneath functions. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. That was very short and punchy. So uh, if we all stay uh, on this track, we'll have uh, some good time for questions at the end. Uh, let's move to uh, uh, calling on Marcelo Mena of the Universidad Católica de Valparaíso. Same question for you, please. What are the expected impacts imposed by biodiversity loss and ecosystem degradation that you identify as the major threats for the near future. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, John, for the invitation. It's wonderful to share um, this opportunity and uh, it's wonderful to see the progress that the central bank has done and the leadership it's taken in the context of uh, addressing biodiversity loss as a threat to well-being overall. And also I wanna highlight the fact that we have in Chile today, uh, science and policy uh, working together, a minister that's an IPCC author, and also a, con a constitutional conventionalist uh, like Cristina Salvador, also a scientist. So we have many of our policies being shaped by our, um, our, our best scientists, and which is a good thing. And so uh, first thing I would say, water scarcity is one of the structural uh, challenges that uh, all countries in the world face. Today, we, it, it is a limiting step for food security and the World Bank in its uh, high and dry report in 2016 highlights that, for example, in places like in, in the MENA region or, or South Asia, uh, you could have almost 6% GDP loss due to uh, the water scarcity issue. In the case of Chile, the, 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 the conflict between mining and water is, is very apparent. Uh, we are discussing whether to protect glaciers. And on one side, we hear the mining sector say that this will hinder growth. On the other side, we acknowledge from science that 70% of central Chile's water comes from glaciers and therefore its preservation is fundamental to sustain other activities such as agriculture or just human activities overall. Um, we have uh, pressures to expand our agricultural production in water scarce areas, and we are actually causing deforestation legally uh, uh, because of the, these because of the pressure that we face. Now, the science has been uh, clear. Waldron and others have uh, put together a report showing that conservation is a, actually a good way to keep uh, some of this well-being to be preserved, and therefore, it's uh, conserving 30% of the planet has five times more uh, benefits than cost. This uh, uh, yields better better agriculture, better, um, better fisheries that are able to recover from overfishing. And uh, so it's just not a matter of, of conserving because of, of, of the uh, environmental reasons, but it's also because it's a way 
to sustain activities. Now, this pandemic has shown us that biodiversity loss has, all, has also led us to become very vulnerable to uh, the, um, the zoonotic disease. Three-fourths of new diseases are from, uh, from zone, zoonotic origin, and the lack of uh, ecological equilibrium is causing this. And we have the, the SARS-CoV-2 crisis going on related to this and many other new diseases that we hear about, including monkeypox, have that sort of uh, relationship. Now, as this, we face this, this crisis today, we have rising food prices that highlight the fact that we are not connecting the dots. Today, we have a food system that's dependent on fossil fuels, and therefore a war in Ukraine could cause the rise of food prices to go to the highest prices ever, and this will likely lead to social unrest globally. And therefore, uh, having a circular economy that uh, has a system, a food system, does not, does not uh, you know, lose 30% of its food that does not use most of its space for uh, inefficient means of production of protein that leads to obesity and malnourishment at the same time. Uh, you know, that highlights the fact that this is that this lack of the biodiversity, water scarcity, and all these issues are actually unfolding into something that will uh, go at the center of the discussions on inflation and on poverty, uh, uh, over, overcoming poverty. So the new constitution that Chile has on the table has an opportunity to face these, uh, um, these struggles. And I think it's a, it's a great opportunity that we had this discussion, not on the side of the ecology or biodiversity, but also in the context of economy. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, excellent. Uh, let's move to someone that Marcelo mentioned in his uh, remarks, and that is uh, Cristina Dorador of the Universidad de Antofagasta. And I'm very interested, uh, Cristina, to hear what you have to say about this matter as a uh, uh, microbiologist and now uh, an associate professor in the Department of Biotechnology. Uh, what are those expected impacts of biodiversity loss and ecosystem degradation that you think are the real threats in the near future? Well, first, um, many thanks for the invitation to be part of this, uh, this panel. Uh, it's very important, I think, to, to talk about uh, the effect of biodiversity loss, especially under an um, economical context. Well, um, as you mentioned, John, I'm a global ecologist. So one of our, our, our objective for many, many years is to convince the ecologists that microbes exist despite they're invisible and they're very important uh, either for biodiversity and also for ecosystem services. I mean, our planet is a microbial planet. We, we, we found life everywhere. Uh, it's very few places on earth when we, we kind of found type of life and probably they're microbial. So this understanding is quite of new and we have only 15 years maybe of, uh, of this new information revealed by large scale uh, metagenomic analysis showing how important microbes are and, actu and are actually one of the maybe less study organisms uh, in terms of, of politics. <laughs> it's, very, it's very rare to hear about uh, microbes in, in, in a politics context. But uh, it's important for countries like Chile where we have largest areas like the Atacama Desert where apparently there's no sign of life, but the life is in mostly my, my microbes. So when we think about economy or, or the exportation of raw materials, also we have to relate that is there is an important part of biodiversity that has been, been affected, but it's not visible. So uh, that is also my, my, our vision that we, when we talk about biodiversity loss, it's not only by mass of species. I mean, species that are more charismatic or, or, you can, or can be visible. Also, there is a large amount of, uh, of an, an under a study uh, organism that, uh, that are everywhere in it. Also, we as a human being, we are an ecosystem. We are full of microbes. And when we change our diet or, or, we, or we, we are affected also in the future by climate change, also the microbes will change and probably affecting our uh, basic function in terms of physiology and development. So uh, directly to the question, of course, uh, the loss of biodiversity have a direct effect, uh, for example, in agriculture or, or food security. Uh, we have to think about the, all the trophic webs that uh, sustain all this productivity is, is based on microbes. So if every, every little change in, in, the, 
let's say, abiotic uh, um, spaces are also affecting the microbial life and they have very important consequences at, at global scale. Um, that's also, for, for example, happened with the fisheries productivity, also affecting the biogeochemical cycles. And, and of course, things that are more maybe not well known, but uh, cultural activities of indigenous people or also science. Because thanks to microbes, we, as Marcelo mentioned, we know that um, how to deal with the pandemics. So the knowledge that we have about vaccines come from the knowledge of microbiology. Um, and that's also very important for the future for biotechnology, how we will adapt and mitigate effect of climate change, probably using these uh, very um, variable uh, strategies that micro have by nature. By nature. So um, as well, I, I just wanted to, to mention that um, it's also important to understand not, not only the biodiversity as species, also it's very important to point it out the interactions because the loss of biodiversity is not just a loss of number, also we lost um, evolution. And, and it's like a network and we are losing dots and, and this losing of interaction at the end of the day produce a massive effect on our, on our surviving basically. So that is my contribution about from the little things that nobody see, but are very, very important. So we're, we're talking about biodiversity also, we have to consider the invisible life that is supporting the planet. Thanks. Christina, I love your point about uh, 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 having to focus not just on species, but on species interactions uh, and uh, uh, because of the importance of some of those interactions, interrelations and dependencies between species. Uh, uh, at the opposite level of organization from what you were highlighting, but something that you of course have very well in mind, I'm sure, is uh, the loss of biodiversity at the sub species level, in other words, populations or species that lose uh, genetic diversity between species uh, uh, are in a difficult position to uh, adapt to changing conditions uh, uh, or to new parasites or diseases than are species with uh, uh, greater biological or genetic diversity within the species. Uh, and that's always worth uh, highlighting. Uh, uh, let me move to Raffaello Cervini, or perhaps I should say Raffaello Cervini, but uh, as lead environmental economist at the World Bank and having spent so much time at uh, in Latin America, I'm sure Raffaello is quite used to being referred to as uh, uh, Cervini. Uh, Raffaello, please. Uh, give us a different perspective. We have heard from uh, in a microbial ecologist, from a climate uh, a, a specialist, uh, and uh, climate engineer. You are you come from a very different place, but you are nevertheless uh, the manager of the global program on sustainability at the World Bank. What do you view as the uh, threats for the near future resulting from this uh, process of biodiversity loss and habitat degradation? Thanks, Marcelo. I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, quite well. Yeah, great. yeah. so thanks for the invitation. Great to be here. And indeed, uh, is uh, Cervini, as you, as you said, but uh, uh, in my several years in Latin America, it, was, it became Cervini. Anyways, um, yeah, so you suggested to put some personal touches, and I'll be happy to do that because I happen to have uh, done my PhD on the economics of biodiversity several years ago, an undisclosed uh, amount of years ago. And, uh, and, um, and so I, I think it's, it's quite uh, interesting to see the difference, right? I mean, as an economy, we struggled way back. Um, uh, I was at the University of London. Uh, to basically make a case and uh, on on uh, you know why should we should care about biodiversity, uh, arguments included uh, you know options value maybe we'll find a new medicine in the Amazon, existent values people care for uh, you know elephants and lions and uh, whatever the endangered species uh, people uh, want to have the options about going on on uh, you know on, on tourism in, in remote areas and so on. 
But now I think we are much uh, stronger grounds. We actually have been able to combine, uh, um, uh, you know, ecology and economics, and uh, we now have a much stronger argument to to make the case uh, that there are significant impacts. I just wanted to uh, kind of advertise a little bit the work that we uh, published last year. Uh, it's called the Economic Case for Nature that we. Uh, uh, published in collaboration with the um, uh, University of Minnesota and uh, Purdue University, um, and is based on a state-of-the-art um, integrated uh, um, uh, global um, Earth economy model. And we basically use that model to answer the question: What happens if uh, uh, you know biodiversity and ecosystem services decline or even collapse? And we focus on four of particular. Uh, significance, but also where uh, the data was uh, was uh, better available. Uh, and these are pollination, uh, timber provision, fisheries, and uh, carbon sequestration and storage. So we basically, um, you know, simulated what would happen to the world economy if uh, these four ecosystem services collapse. And of course, uh, there are good indications that we are nearing tipping points in the provision of the services. We don't know how soon that will happen but if that happens uh, we basically estimated that uh, this would uh, uh, cause a um, 2.7 trillion dollars loss in the gdp of the world um, you know compare this is in 2030 compared to business as usual uh, now at the global scale this is uh, about two and a half uh, percentage point but if you look at the geographic distribution, this um, adds up to about 10% uh, collapse in GDP of the lower income countries and about 6 or 7% of the lower middle income countries. But of course, as a development institution, we uh, greatly care about the impacts that this will have on growth and poverty alleviation. And then again, you know, the 10% average for the lower income country conceals much larger impacts for countries like Bangladesh or Madagascar, or other countries that deeply rely on ecosystem services for, um, uh, you know, for for G, for for uh, income and for jobs and, and so forth. So you know, uh, why should we care? Because these are very material uh, impacts on the on the prosperity uh, of countries, uh, particularly the less fortunate ones, and their, on their prospects for for future growth. And interestingly, uh, I mean, while some of these impacts might be uh, kind of, uh, uh, let's say, put in a, a second uh, uh, order of importance compared to COVID. But, uh, you know, if we lose an ecosystem, it will be very difficult to replace it with, with other uh, provision of, of, of uh, uh, you know, production and well-being. Um, fortunately, um, the, you know, the study also suggests that by putting in place what we call nature smart policies, um, we can actually reverse uh, or, let's say, prevent a lot of these uh, risks. So we estimated that uh, uh, there would be a significant, um, you know, in business as usual, a, a significant loss of natural areas. And by putting in place nature smart policies, and I'm going to say in a minute what we mean by that, uh, we can prevent up to 50% of the loss of natural areas. The nature smart policies we have analyzed include uh, the repurposing of uh, perverse agricultural subsidies. Um, the, um, let's say, investment in agricultural uh, research and development that would, uh, um, you know, help uh, intensify production rather than extensify into, into forested or other natural areas, as well as schemes for payment, global and national schemes uh, of uh, payment for ecosystem services that uh, uh, seem to be quite uh, outlandish uh, 20 years ago, but now they're becoming really uh, common, uh, a common thing that we observe. Uh, and so that gives us a lot of uh, uh, ground for optimism that by really working with countries to design and implement the right policies, we can really, um, you know, uh, deliver both improved, uh, um, you know, economic outcomes at the same time as, um, uh, you know, improve the uh, nature outcomes. Uh, of course, the devil's in the details, and perhaps we can say a bit more on the second part of the discussion. We'll be happy to elaborate on that. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, uh, Rafaelo. And finally, let's move on to uh, Catherine Willis. Uh, Kathy is, uh, as I mentioned, principal of St. Edmund Hall at Oxford, uh, University of Oxford, but a professor of biodiversity, a title that one still does not see uh, very often. Uh, and I'd be very interested in your thoughts, uh, Kathy, about those major uh, threats for the near future caused by biological impoverishment. Kathy?
Um, right, can you hear me now? We can hear you now, okay, yes. Hello. So uh, hello, everyone, and thank you. And it's always hard to be the last person to speak because everyone else has said what you're going to say. However, I, I mean, I agree with absolutely everything that's gone on before. And I think that there is, there is a, you know, we, we can think of many examples of the natural environment when you lose those really important ecosystem services that you, and the impoverished, the loss of biodiversity that goes that leads on to losing things so you end up with a loss of flood protection um air and water pollution crop pollination but the one i want to focus on the thing that i think we often lose sight of when we're talking about these other other activities and other things we're losing is actually to do with uh physical and mental health and the link between that and biodiversity and i just give you um, an example that now, 71% of deaths globally, that's 41 million people a year, die from non-communicable diseases. So that is things like respiratory diseases, and it's, it's anxiety and things caused through cancers and various other diseases, that when you look at the concentration of where those diseases are, they invariably are in areas where you have removed the biodiversity, the areas become increasingly urbanized, and you end up with these 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 well, terrible death rates going on, and asthma rates in cities, for example. There's a so many studies now showing when you take the trees away from the cities, that's when you start to get the increase in asthma because the trees themselves are providing that incredibly important ecosystem service of clearing the the particulate matter from the air. And I mean, I, I could go on about this, but it's pollution of the rivers, it's pollution of our waters, pollution of our air. And so we often forget, we often take the human dimension out of it. We think about these, these economic goods that we are losing, but actually it's human health, physical and mental health that gets lost when we lose biodiversity. And we're already seeing that happening. And if there's not a, you know, a better reason for bringing back you know, biodiversity into cities, that's one of the, for me, a very strong point. Excellent, thank you. Uh, coincidentally, just yesterday, I was debating with a couple of colleagues, uh, what are the costs that one must include when mm -hmm. deciding, uh, when answering the question, how much does it cost and what are the minimum actions that we must take to sustainably manage our biodiversity for the long term? And one of the questions that we were grappling with is uh, the greening of urban areas. Is that an essential cost for the maintenance of biodiversity in the long term? And uh, 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 yep. the, where we were, you know, we were, we didn't sort of land, all land in the same place, but the debate was, could you consider, is it important that cities become greener if we are going to uh, 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 manage sustainable uh, sustainability and, and uh, pardon me, manage biodiversity and manage our species yeah. richness uh, longer term. Uh, and and uh, there was there was at least one colleague arguing that urban areas are much more important repositories of biodiversity than we realize. Number one, uh, everything from uh, bird migration flyways to any number of other things, mm -hmm. but. The mental and physical health that results from urban greening can yeah. actually indirectly support the process of biodiversity management in other areas, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, uh, well, there's the, the health. So people who work in health economics are showing that if you prescribe nature in cities for many, many of the, the things like antidepressants, that if you put you know, more green spaces, less antidepressants, it's cheaper to create the green space than it is to prescribe the drug. And so when you look at that on a pure economic basis, I haven't got the figures with me, but there, it's a stark difference from the, about actually prescribing nature rather than prescribing drugs in terms of costs. Terrific. Um, Kathy remarked on the fact that she was uh, the last uh, uh, of our five panelists. So just to... Uh, 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 keep things a little unpredictable and not hurt her in that situation again. We're going to mix up the order again uh, uh, for the question, uh, for the second question. So 
Uh, as a reminder uh, to the panelists and uh, just for the information, of course, of the audience, the question number two that we are tackling is, what are the main gaps in our current knowledge of metrics and economic analysis tools that we need to address in order to assess biodiversity and ecosystem conditions? So metrics and economic analysis, what are we missing compared to what we must have if we are to uh, uh, assess biodiversity and ecosystems and, and uh, as a result of that, assess their loss or degradation. And if I may start with uh, uh, Marcelo, uh, who brings an interesting perspective, not just as a scientist, but also as a former Minister of the Environment of Chile. Uh, uh, please, Marcelo. Yeah, great, thank you. So. I think it's a really great point, and I'll, I'll give Rodrigo some tips of some of the things that we, we had challenges with and, and maybe address them. We had very strong um, analysis to support action on air pollution because the cost of mortality is very high. Uh, but when we wanted to do um, secondary air water quality standards, which is about ecosystem benefits, we didn't have the same types of uh, uh, strength. And so therefore, whenever we wanted to regulate for example, uh, nitrogen in, in waterways. Uh, we never had the, 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 the analysis and the support that we wanted. Uh, and since we have environmental tribunals, we knew that if we went to these uh, with regulations without strong uh, analysis, we wouldn't be able to take them to court. And we actually had some regulations be uh, taken back because of, we didn't have strong analysis. So, but then the funny thing is that, you know, we tried to do the same thing with the KFOs to reduce uh, ammonia emissions because of odor, and we didn't have the, the analysis. But the third time around, with the air pollution in Santiago, considering the fact that 11% of air pollution in Santiago comes from ammonia, we did have the benefit, and we have mandatory regulations on ammonia emissions because of air pollution. So, so what I'm saying here is that we should always use every single uh, analysis tool that we have, uh, and that will allow us to have the evidence that we didn't have at that point. So this is like Al Capone going to jail because of taxes, but you know this is something that we need to uh, overlook. The other thing there, it's important, is that um, we never look at we look at this always in the marginal benefit, and never uh, and this marginal uh, uh, cost approach or marginal benefit approach never looks at the cost of collapse. And so, therefore, when you have no water, when you have no ecosystems being provided, the infinite there's an infinite cost that we do not consider, and we should find ways. And in this regard, I want to uh, highlight a conversation I had with a, a German uh, designer of coastal, um, coastal protections. He said very strongly, you're in Latin America, you have to do whatever you can to protect coastal ecosystems, because they provide services for free that we have to do much more expensively with uh, gray infrastructure. And, um, and so therefore, sometimes we do not take that into account. When we're looking into conservation, we're looking into uh, losing these things with the, ultimate, the, the infinite pressures that the coastal ecosystems have with, uh, with multiple reasons, uh, um, you know, infrastructure, housing, et cetera. When we don't consider those, uh, those, uh, those services that are provided for free, then basically we just ignore them and they are lost and we have to replace them with something that's much more expensive and much more unproven. So I just wanted to say that that's probably the biggest challenge that we have uh, overall. And I work today in this methane hub. Uh, we are looking to reduce methane for multiple reasons. And this really provides us uh, an opportunity to look at the food system and connect those dots. To think about, for example, a food system that's more efficient delivering protein and calories without uh, causing deforestation, but also uh, with a food system that doesn't lose 30% of its production and is landfilled causing methane problems, landfill fires like we've seen in Delhi and others, when we could have done composting and used that uh, compost to provide nutrients to soils at a much uh, lower cost and less dependent to fossil fuels than the current system. So I think this is probably the most important uh, uh, suggestion I'd say, to think of things as a systems uh, approach and not think of uh, solutions just on an individual problem we want to solve. Thanks so much. Thank you, Marcelo. Uh, let me move to uh, Cristina Dorador, 
uh, are member of the National Constituent Assembly of Chile and a microbial ecologist. Uh, Cristina, knowledge gaps on metrics and economic analytical tools. Uh, um, what can you tell us? Well, the, um, I think many things to say. Yeah. First, because we are talking about biodiversity. So first we need to understand what we're talking about. It has to be a common idea. So when now with the current understanding of what is a uh, whole life organized on Earth, also we came to a point to we don't we are not clear about what is a species. I <laughs> know that's complicated, but we don't know actually. We we when we when we see, for example, I don't know a bear, that uh, we can say this is a bear and the other is a it's a dog. But when we go again into um a way to see the nature as, an, as a very complex interaction or, or clouds of interaction, we cannot really realize who is who. Um, especially when we're, we're, we're thinking about genetics, when we, we, we work now with, with these high um, analytic uh, tools like metagenomics. It's like the same that happened with astronomy. Uh, to, to understand the composition of exoplanet, uh, they, don't, they don't see any image, they, they just have data. And the data have to be interpreted and then realize how, how the planet, what is kind of atmosphere have, for, for example. So here happened almost similar with biodiversity. When we see as a whole thing, we, we, we have like a, like a clouds of interaction that can mean a different species. And that is important because we have to advance in a complex understanding of what we are losing when we think about losing of biodiversity. We don't lose just on species, we lose again, as I mentioned before, interactions. So that's I think is one of the important gaps to, to try to update the knowledge and to understand it as a, as a system. And, and also uh, to understand as well that a species is, is you don't you can you cannot have a species alone, isolated without their environment or their habitat. So that's also it's very important to talk about endemism. There are many, many species that are endemic of certain places. So when it is a, a, a loss of habitat or low habitat degradation, also is a, is a loss of biodiversity. It's, it's, it's almost, um, it's, it's together, it's a together interaction. So I would want to give an example what happened here in Northern Chile. Now we are currently under the lithium fever. Now everyone wants lithium to, to support the electromobility. But lithium in South America come from salares, so from, come from salty lakes. And those lakes are dominated by microbial life. So um, at the beginning of this um, explosion of interest of lithium, nobody was, or very few people was talking about the environmental effect because apparently nothing is, is being affected because it's only salt. But our research um, show that, uh, not only our research, many other research show on, on, on papers show that um, this is full of biodiversity and this is limit. Uh, this is a limit of life. This is a line limit of life on Earth. And so the only way to, to obtain lithium in, in Salaris is destroying the ecosystem. So that is also half an economical cost and have to be included. For example, uh, when we calculate the GDP of a country, it's not, it doesn't include the, the environmental effects or all the possible effect that uh, can you know, um, be linked to the population. Also, it's not, it's not included, uh, it's more than gender, but um, the, the work of a woman, no? they, they're taking care of, of families. So then I think there are many gaps uh, we have to think about it and, and include it in this equation. And also another one is another subject in Chile, especially, we have a lack of people um, that are especially in taxonomy and systematics. So people that know, don't understand very well what is a species and what not to have this inventory. Uh, and that was a political decision many years ago when and some people saw that this is all knowledge and this is an old school uh, tools. We don't need to, to form more people about that. And actually they didn't receive any more, any more funding. Uh, currently, it's very difficult that someone, and for example, especially in, in, in insects and entomologists, can receive funding to describe new species. It's almost impossible um, because they don't have a specific funding. So that is an important gap because we have a um, large amount of species that have not been described or studied yet. And we are losing uh, ecosystems. We don't know them. 
And that's why also so we need to advance in, in information too. This information has to be available to people. We have to, as well, work into empower people and community to do more local and local science and, and, and local you know, environment um, activities to, to know more about the biodiversity. And that's also important in, care of, uh, in, in, term, in terms of conservation. So people have to know their own biodiversity. I think that's also very important. Yes, uh, you're, you're putting your finger on one of the great tragedies of uh, the biodiversity crisis. It's not just that we're losing biological diversity, but we don't know the biological diversity that we are losing because not only in Chile, but around the world, uh, uh, funding agencies have shifted their attention from uh, uh, what is viewed as rather old fashioned and conventional uh, uh, work in taxonomy and systematics of specific uh, uh, groups of organisms uh, to uh, uh, work in genetics or in other disciplines where familiarity with the particular organism is uh, less the focus. And uh, the, the, our estimates today of biological diversity around the world uh, are, you know, differ by an order of magnitude because of the, precisely because of that lack of understanding of the, uh, 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 the most basic fact, which is how many species do we have on earth and what are those species? Um, Kathy, let me go back to you, if I may. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I can pick up. Uh, of the, I have three points actually against this, and I'll stick to my four minutes. But I'll. I mean, the first one. I just want to pick up on that last point. Yes, we have got a big problem in not knowing how many species there are. But what we really need to focus on, I would say, is which species are really important for the ecosystem service flows that come from them. When we're looking at it in a natural capital framing, and. I think so. Therefore, taking that one stage further, then the question or the knowledge gap there is if you are a, an organization, a bank, or a, a business that wants to measure your natural capital assets and the flows from them, what should you measure? And we still haven't got an agreement on that. I mean, I've got a very good um, example before about air pollution and what you can measure. And it often ends up being what is, what's available, not that we have a common set of metrics that we can all be using to measure, to get the same, to understand the flows across the world. Now, the work that's being done by uh, Greta um, Daly and others is excellent and it's filling some of that gap. But we've also got a question of trade-offs in there. So the, the thing we are good at measuring right now is carbon because there's a carbon market and therefore nature-based carbon is one thing where we do have a pretty good idea about the amount of sequestration going on. But in that process to rush to measure carbon because of offsets, we're forgetting all the other natural capital assets that we want from that same set of nature. So we're ending up with large, vast eucalyptus plantations which are really bad for biodiversity. So you've, you've got a trade-off in there whereby trying to look at one natural capital asset and ignoring the others, that you end up with this, this, this bad trade-off actually for biodiversity. So that's my first point. The second one is a more governance point, and that is on a board. So you have a board for a bank or a board for a business, and I've sat on various boards. You always have the board focusing on financial performance. Who on that board is focusing on natural capital performance? And how do you balance your natural capital performance alongside your financial performance? Because right now, natural capital and biodiversity is always the in the environmental sustainability pot discussed at the end, but actually if you don't meet that, that requirement, does it matter? Well, absolutely it does, but we don't view them in the same way. So there's a really important gap there about getting natural capital performance in the boardroom and someone on that board really responsible for it. And then my third one, is that we're talking broadly here, and I know Raffaello or somebody mentioned Madagascar and other countries um, which are in less developed countries.
But how do we ensure that all of these conversations we're having and all of this work we're doing, that we're not leaving the, the less developed countries behind? Because I see two parallel systems going on right now. We have those countries that are steaming ahead with natural capital, and yet you've still got these less developed countries that, quite frankly, they can't afford to be doing natural capital modelling right now because that's so low on their list of priorities because of the other things they have. So there are three points in there really about, you know, um, how do we integrate financial performance? What metrics should we be measuring for natural capital? And then how do we ensure that everyone is comes along together? Or we don't leave people behind. Thank you very much, Kathy, for those observations. And uh, let me turn to uh, Rodrigo Arraigada again uh, and ask about uh, the metrics and analytical right. tools that we need uh, where are our gaps? Please let us right. know your thoughts. Yeah, okay. Uh, so uh, as, I, as I explained the role now uh, as a government official, there, there are several things that I, I, I must say. But let, let me start with, with something that is, I think is, is, is some kind of missing in, in this debate. The key role of biodiversity in ensuring an adequate level of human well-being is really considered. A priority. So we need to take into account that as, as a fact. And, and often short-term objectives that seek to ensure certain economic benefits are prioritized um, in, in, even in, in public actions. Um, so especially when local livelihoods depend on natural environments and, and conservation efforts do not adequately incorporate the social roles of these environments, this affects certainly the efficiency and effectiveness of policy actions. So in terms of gaps, uh, there are several gaps that relate with data, that relate with methods, that relate even with conceptual frameworks. So in, in the case of knowledge gaps that currently pre prevail regarding biodiversity in, in a very Chilean context, is it is worth highlighting the fact that there is inadequate evidence for re-evaluations of threatened species. So the Inter International Union of Conservation of Nature Red List of Threatened Species is, is actually uh, becoming the world's most comprehensive source of information on the global conservation status of many species. So in this regard, we as a country, uh, we need to move towards a permanent monitoring of these uh, threatened species, along with, a, with an adequate mapping of uh, uh, genetic di diversity, given the important changes in, in, in context, in terms of social, economic, and environmental context that the country is actually experiencing. So this will ensure updated conservation policy responses uh, to current local realities. At the ecosystem level, it is essential uh, for Chile to have spatially explicit information, including adequate spatial resolutions of those in, uh, of those uh, uh, of this information. So mapping of the current state of ecosystems at, at, at very different scales, like local, regional levels. So ensuring consistent and coherent methodologies for measuring the state of ecosystem over time is also very critical. Uh, that make possible, for example, to make temporary evaluations of the conservation status. Now, um, uh, we are not uh, uh, approaching the, the evaluation of ecosystem services in a consistent way across time. So it's, it's def different um, or, or it's very challenging to uh, adequate or evaluate uh, changes in pattern across time. Now, at the level of ecosystem services, uh, I think for Chile, it is completely essential to be able to adequately understand how climate change is actually affecting the provision of these services. Uh, it can be assumed that climate change certainly affects the provision of these services in different ways, but we need to be able to confirm these relationships with very, very strong and, and rigorous scientific evidence. So in this regard, for example, having maps of the ecosystem service at the natural level will make it possible to focus climate action on the territories that require them mostly. 
Similarly, strategic local development plans can benefit significantly from this type of information. Now, as an environmental economist, also I need to talk about the economic value of biodiversity and ecosystem services that biodiversity provide. Uh, so this, uh, in my opinion, is one of the fundamental pillars for the sustainable use of biodiversity. So in, in that regard, we must understand that the economic valuation of biodiversity consists of giving a monetary value to ecosystem goods and services that are not traded in the markets and therefore do not have an explicit price. So we all know uh, traditional markets by not considering the economic value of biodiversity tend to fail in the social optimal allocation of resources. So that results in the overuse and consequent degradation of biodiversity and associated ecosystem services. So in that regard, advancing in very robust methods of economic valuation that allow grouping the totality of the different economic values because economic valuation is by definition a subjective exercise. So if we, if we can add all these different values uh, associated with biological diversity, distinguishing in, in some sense the different ways in which ecosystem services benefit human beings is becoming extremely urgent. So in a, a scenario of major global change, the cost of inaction must be properly estimated as much as the benefits of climate action. So this will make possible to better define different courses of action that are cost efficient and that promote an equitable distribution of costs and benefits by incorporating all the dimensions of environmental inequality in the, target, in the targeting of climate uh, action and public policies in, in very general terms. Thank you. Rodrigo, thank you very much. And uh, finally, let me return to Raffaello Cervini uh, to hear his perspective as an environmental economist at the World Bank on these knowledge gaps and particularly on metrics. Rafaelo, please. Thank you. Um, I have four points. Let's see if I can go through them uh, in one minute each. Uh, so the first point, we definitely need uh, more data on uh, ecosystem services, just to give you an example of the things that we couldn't do in our work that I mentioned earlier. Uh, there is a very big role being played by ecosystem services in regulating water cycle. Uh, you know, preventing uh, soil erosion, preventing uh, sedimentation of, of uh, reservoirs, and this will have big impacts on, let's say, the ability of country to, uh, you know, deliver irrigation or hydropower. So that's that's very important, and we need to have a better way to to measure that. Um, the second point, we need to have better tools. It's not just just about measuring the, the physical value, but the trade offs with economics, right? So I mentioned before that. Uh, we are now making progress uh, on kind of developing, uh, uh, let's say, integrated uh, uh, economic and ecosystem services modeling and approaches, but that takes effort. It's still uh, kind of a, a complex uh, array of tools that not uh, everyone kind of masters. So we definitely need to invest in human capacity for doing that. The third point is that we need not just data, but credible data. And uh, this need to be institutionalized. They need to be credible because there are lots of vested interests at stake. I just mentioned in my early intervention that one key option, for instance, is to reform, uh, repurpose agricultural subsidies, subsidies. You can imagine the vested interest there. So if you want to show that uh, reforming a subsidy delivers more benefit than the cost, we, 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 have to do, we have to do it in a way that is credible. And for doing that, we basically need to have... Uh, official data and statistics on, on natural capital and ecosystem services. There are now a UN sanctioned uh, set of standards, but the capacity in many countries to actually uh, you know, implement that standard is still quite limited, right? So until we get a way to get uh, these numbers in the official statistics, just like uh, employment or uh, you know, physical capital and so on, uh, we're not gonna be able to, to achieve the objectives. And finally, we need also to have simple metrics. And I, I link back to the, um, uh, I think Katie was making the point about the financial uh, industry. Um, the financial industry, I think, is starving for, for uh, metrics to which they can link uh, financing, right? So uh, the impact investor community, 
I think is very ready to kind of, uh, um, you know, channel money in the right direction, but they need to have simple metrics, uh, you know, to use, for instance, if uh, let's say we want to bring down the coupon of a bond, right? Is it just the forest extent, the forest condition? How do we, me- how do we measure in, in a way that the financial markets can easily pick up whether a forest has been uh, keeping this extent, whether it's still in good condition or in bad condition? These are things uh, on which really we need to do a lot more work. And in fact, is one of the um, priorities of the um, program that I happen to manage at the World Bank, the Global Program of Sustainability. We're actively uh, collaborating with uh, several stakeholders in the industry to come up with sort of a KPIs, key performance indicators of related to nature, to which uh, you know, financing can be associated, both public and private financing as well. So let me stop here. Rafaelo, thank you very much for uh, those thoughts. And I have to uh, thank and congratulate our various panelists for remarkable discipline uh, and uh, keeping to time. Uh, We now have about three to four minutes uh, left. So uh, um, uh, 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 I suppose uh, there is a couple of questions that have come in that I would like to uh, share with at least one of our panelists. And one of them has to do with the role of the the current uh, National Constituent Assembly of Chile and uh, is directed at uh, Cristina Varador. And uh, the, none of our questions address the policy issue and certainly not the constitutional issues. But as a member of the uh, assembly, uh, Cristina, is there anything that uh, you would like to bring into this discussion uh, from your role as a member of the assembly? Um, yeah, we are almost in the final um, time of the conventional constitution uh, assembly, and um, I think we are advancing a lot in terms of recognizement of our relationship with, of, of human with nature, and also when we analyze the, the text that we will propose soon, as uh, all people and this is already available, the first draft uh, show in. A very well, I think, position of the ecological ethics. So we also declare ourselves as an ecological state. And that is, for us, is very important. And we have also several articles pointed out, for example, the rights of nature, as well in, in legal status um, includes um, the tribunal, environmental tribunals in every region. And as well, we, um, accept and, and, and approve and a, a very important article regarding biodiversity that the state have um, a crucial role in conservation of uh, biodiversity and, and also not only that also their interactions so I think that's uh, it's an important tool for the future to to advance in a specific laws of protection and conservation especially of uh, endangered habitat that we have in the country um, not only because of climate change, but also of human activity. So I invite the audience to, to check the, the draft because um, it's, it's very vanguard, it's, it's very on the thinking on the cutting future. Cutting edge, cutting edge. Yeah, cutting edge, exactly. So we are, we're kind of happy, we are very happy actually for this uh, result uh, of ecology. Fabulous, Christina. I didn't uh, know about those provisions of the current draft. Uh, I'd be, I will follow up and and have a look at the draft as you just suggested. And we have literally uh, one minute left. Uh, And there is a question that I think is best addressed to Kathy, because Kathy uh, has a role not only uh, uh, as many professors do in research and education, but as principal of St. Edmund Hall perhaps has a a broader, more general, or more holistic uh, uh, set of responsibilities in respect of forming future leaders. Yeah. So, in that, come from that perspective, in sixty seconds or less, um, what is the role of education? And I don't necessarily mean universities as research institutions, but of education, higher education. 
uh, and training of economists and business people. The ecologists, I think, are mostly taken care of, but uh, of people who will work in positions in economics, finance, and policy in the future. How do, what can a biodiversity specialist like you uh, do to, uh, uh, through them, address the crisis? So I think, I mean, I think so very quickly, I mean, we absolutely in Oxford, uh, you know, everybody's, uh, we have a new environmental sustainability strategy, where everybody will do basic courses in, in, in biodiversity and in economics, so that you start to build the two together, you don't teach them separately, you teach them together. And we have to start speaking the same language, because language is often where we get lost, someone will start talking in great detail and giving Latin plant names. But this comes back to the point you have to look at which bits people need to understand in order to be able to build the metrics so we are doing that but also I think the student body is incredible they're absolutely driving this agenda right now and and we have to keep up with them and show them that we really are listening to them and creating the courses that they can then become the next leaders. Excellent thank you so much and uh, just in time I will thank uh, our panelists again for their discipline, Uh, thank the audience for joining us. And with that, I will pass it back to Daniela Torres and Gonzalo Garcia Trujillo. Um, Thank you very much, John. Uh, Thank you for this uh, wonderful uh, work that you did as moderator of this session. And especially thank you for uh, our panelists in in this last session of the day. you, you had a, an amazing uh, discussion about the key things that we, we should be aware of in, 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 in Chile and in, in the world in general. So um, I want to invite you to join us uh, tomorrow uh, for the second day of our conference. We will talking about uh, macroeconomic modeling and the impact of the loss of biodiversity on on macroeconomics, and also uh, biodiversity as a risk for financial stability. So please join us tomorrow. Uh, we are going to start at 9 a.m. 9 a.m. And, and that's all. So thank you very much, everyone, and, and see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.